All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the review. So uh, before we get started, uh, let me just introduce myself. I think some of you know me already. I'm Dr. Paul Bryan. I'm a second year family medicine resident. Uh, I'm doing a medical education elective right now, which is a lot of fun. So it's last week of it. So I had a chance to see some of you in some other teaching sessions, which has been uh, really fun and, and awesome. So. Um, Today we're going to review a few things. So as I just said, I'm in primary care, right? So it's a little bit of a different take than what some of your other lectures have uh, have been exposed to and what resources they have at the tip of their fingers. And I think that's pretty apparent based on some of the lecture slides. So today we're going to review, and I'll get into this a bit, about a quarter of the content on your exam, okay? So we won't be able to cover everything. There's just not enough time. But I'm covering some of the more tricky subjects that I feel really comfortable with because I see them every single day in primary care. So these are meant to give you some like practical approaches. And I've also like reviewed all your previous lectures with the pertinent stuff on the blueprint so that it's consistent with the information you've learned. Um, these are like, you know, approaches that I use. And it was pretty apparent going through the lecture slides that these weren't approaches that were given to you. So even me going in and reading those slides with like a lot of like clinical context, I was uh, not gonna lie, like pretty confused at parts. And I think that just goes to show that like it's a specialist teaching you. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to be a specialist, you could probably go back to those slides and you could be like, these are amazing. There's so much good info here. And that happens to me all the time once I gain more knowledge in a certain area. But for your guys' purposes and the level you're at, this should help you going forward day to day clinically when clerkship starts, and then also hopefully for the test, okay? So um, I really want you guys to ask as many questions as possible because some of the stuff that I highlight may just sort of skim some of the stuff that's confusing to you or just breeze past some of that stuff. And that's uh, an opportunity for you just to ask that question and then I can integrate it into, you know, the approach that I have and I can help uh, hopefully clarify any, any confusion around these topics, okay? So without, without further ado, we'll just, we'll just go ahead and get started. So I have, I have no disclosures. I'm a peasant. And uh, copyright, uh, I did what I thought the copyright wanted me to do. Uh, did my best. OK, they're mostly original slides. So. Um, we have uh, quite a few learning objectives to get to, but we're just going to really like, do the big, broad you know, principles to help organize your guys' thinking and help you on the test. So, First one is to learn a focused approach to common family medicine neurological complaints, and we'll go through what those complaints are in a second. And the objectives kind of hint at them as well. So we want to learn just like some common localized peripheral neuropathies. And you know, these things are, are very easily identifiable once you kind of are aware of the ones that are possible and, and the patterns that repeatedly show up, right? So there's always the most common ones, and we'll go through some rapid cases for those. Uh, number three, so Assessment and differential diagnosis of patient with undifferentiated headache, so like the headache NYD. So this will be really helpful for going through your patients on your tests that likely have a primary headache in terms of comprehensively from assessment all the way to management. And then, you know, when you're assessing, what you're really doing is ruling out the bad things. So it's also going to be those same questions on your test that present like, you know, this is a headache and you have to differentiate whether it's a primary or secondary cause. So, you know, things like a meningitis, things like a brain tumor are going to look like a headache question on your test. You won't be able to differentiate them until you apply some of these approaches and schemes. So that'll all fit in there. And then chronic management of migraine, we'll go into a little bit more detail of the management, give you some approaches to it, and the big sort of broad categories that you should be thinking about on the test that may help you. And then assessment and differential diagnosis of patient with undifferentiated dizziness. So this is what I was kind of alluding to with like, this is a very specialized area, but it's a super common primary presentation. And our approach is much different than what a specialist would be when they're coming into an ENT clinic or a neurology clinic or some other specialist clinic. So I really just focus on the things that are most common and the things that are really bad that you don't want to miss. And we can group that and we can make a short list of things that we worry about and then a focused physical and history for it. So uh, we'll go through that and that'll help you pick out all the pertinent stuff and get the questions right on the test hopefully. Um, then we're going to go through a geriatric case, and so specifically we're going to talk about the well geriatric patient and the sort of routine care of a geriatric patient. And we'll talk about the principles of geriatrics and why we do those things and how they guide us in our management. And specifically go in a little bit deeper on cognitive impairment in the elderly patient, 
as well as falls in the elderly patient, okay? So here's the breakdown. I won't spend too much time on this, but we do cover about a quarter of your exam, okay? So it's pretty good content, and some of these are a little bit more confusing topics, so we need to spend more time, okay? I probably have enough content to just speak straight for about an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll get out of here either a little bit early, or if there's lots of questions at the end or throughout, I'd be happy to like kind of break it down. And I have a couple breaks where you guys are going to be talking with your, uh, with your person beside you. And don't worry, we're not going to do like a 30-minute breakdown and like go into small groups and stuff like that. We're just going to do like one or two minutes of like you kind of reviewing on your own the big pertinent things. And then we're going to compare that to my approach and see, you know, where you guys are thinking the right things and maybe things that you need to add on to what you're thinking. All right, the only other thing I'll add is, um, so I did this test four years ago. Um, I don't remember it, so that's good for a couple of reasons. So I got an email from Dr. Bush, not directly, but indirectly from Dr. Bush, basically saying like, it's a very uh, severe breach of professionalism to give hints away for questions. And that's okay, because I don't remember any of them. But like, you know, I do the same thing that you guys would do and look at the blueprint and say, you know, like, what's the most likely question that's going to show up? And you can usually have a pretty good idea based on stuff that's just like really common that you need to know, right? Remember that even though you guys get taught by specialists, the tests are pretty good, actually, at asking you about, you know, what are the really clinically relevant things that you need to know, right? So that's why I like this generalist approach. It can be kind of helpful. So I hope you guys get something from that. All right, so without further ado, we're just gonna do some rapid fire cases. So these are just like some warm up cases to get the brains going, okay? So first one coming up. So we have a patient here who's complaining of numbness and tingling in the hand. It's a 36 year old female with intermittent tingling in both hands. So feel free to show the answer if you get it once, once oh, while I'm reading even. Tingling in both hands that has been ongoing for three months. The pain is worse at night. And when working at her desk as a receptionist, um, it helps to shake her hands out. The pain is primarily in her fourth and fifth digits. She has no neck pain. Physical exam is normal. It's a diagnosis. So ulnar neuropathy is the correct term, right? So it's sort of like a classic presentation where you're thinking like this is a peripheral neuropathy, not a radiculopathy with pain in the neck and like shooting down the entire arm, but like actually focal numbness and tingling in the hand. So you might be thinking like the most common is carpal tunnel and you'd be correct, but the second most common is uh, ulnar neuropathy, which sometimes people call uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, okay, as it runs through the elbow, but that's just one place where it can get cut off. So that's maybe like the most likely place where you have a lot of movement at the elbow and you have a lot of potential compression while the, um, while the nerve runs like past the medial epicondyle. So just know that that's possible too. And again, like the same principles to treating carpal tunnel apply, but obviously just need to be adapted to that. So like you wouldn't do a carpal release for someone with these symptoms, right? That would be the incorrect treatment. But you could still do the same like conservative things like, you know, modifying their activity, potentially using braces, using anti-inflammatories, either topically or orally to see if that helps, using the adjunctive nerve pain medications that you guys have recently learned about. So all that stuff still applies, but this is just recognizing that that's not the only peripheral nerve that can be affected in the hand, and you really have to go down to like what are the key information on that. So for this one, it's the fourth and fifth digits, which is the ulnar uh, pattern of the peripheral nerve that covers for sensory perception. Okay. Case two. Okay, so case two, pain shooting down the right leg. It's a 52-year-old male with pain for five days since lifting a heavy object. He had sudden onset of lower back pain when he twisted while holding the object. Since then, he has had shooting pain down the right leg. He denies any bowel slash bladder incontinence. He's got a severely antalgic gait, unable to toe slash heel walk, right, due to pain. Numbness in the posterior leg and lateral right foot, decreased right ankle jerk, right? So that doesn't seem like a ton of information, but based on that, you can typically make a diagnosis. So what would be the diagnosis for this patient? Yeah, S1 radiculopathy, right? Most likely due to disc herniation, but you'd want to consider all etiologies, right? So what are the features that make you think that? So the pain starting in the back and going down to the leg, right? And it's like a shooting pain, which makes it seem like it's nerve associated. And it's a middle-aged male. So remember, the disc herniation is at high risk for a middle-aged person because they still have enough pulposis to actually cause enough protrusion of that disc into the foramen where the nerve root is or into the canal and 
take out one of those nerves as they're coming through in the cauda equina, okay? But you're also old enough, right? So you're young enough, so you have enough pulposis to do that, but you're old enough where the annulus, the fibrous tissue in the disc on the outside, has broken down enough where there's potential where an acute injury could potentially rip it and allow that pulposis to push through, okay? So if you're younger than that, usually your fibrous annulus is strong enough to contain it. And then if you're too old, you get nice dry bones and you don't have any pulposis and it is less likely to be a disc herniation causing the symptoms. Okay, so this would be like a classic patient. So uh, this is S1 radiculopathy. And then the other most common one would be, so there's two that are like very, very common. S1 is one common one. L5 is the other common one you'd hear of, right? So just think about how that would be different, right? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So now we have case three. So this is uh, someone who's complaining of difficulty walking. It's a 31-year-old female with weakness in her left foot. Just started two weeks ago. It's kind of insidious. She's otherwise healthy. She denies any pain at all. On exam, she clearly has an abnormal gait with difficulty with the left foot. And then when you test the strength of that leg, you find that she's weak in dorsiflexion, like quite weak, three out of five. Uh, and then she has some subjective numbness of the lateral leg as well and dorsal aspect of the foot. What's the diagnosis here? There's like a common term that people would use to describe this type of presentation. So this is drop foot, okay? So remember how drop foot is basically an abnormality in the nerves that control the muscles that dorsiflex your foot, which you need while you're walking, right? If you don't have that, you kind of just drag your foot around. So you trip, you have difficulty walking, right? And it's, it's quite common for them to actually have just like isolated uh, muscle weakness, but they could have other things like uh, numbness and tingling in the associated area, right? Which they have an exam this person didn't complain about and then pain as well. So the sensory and the motor, motor components of the symptoms. And then don't forget that drop foot isn't a diagnosis in of itself. You have to recognize it, but there's a differential with that as well. So that L5 radiculopathy, once it becomes severe enough and causes motor impairment, you could potentially get a drop foot, right? But again, they would have those features that make you think some middle-aged male where there's like an obvious event and they have lower back pain associated with it. They have shooting sciatic pain down the leg. So it's a little bit different. So again, think of this type of drop foot with this presentation as basically like the carpal tunnel of the lower, lip, lower extremity, okay? And so the reason that this happens is you have the peroneal nerve or the fibular nerve that comes and it, you know, innervates some of the nerves in the anterior compartment of the lower leg to help you dorsiflex and also the lateral compartment to help you evert, right? So that's why they have weakness in those areas. And it comes right around the fibular head, which is like this bony structure that you can feel on the lateral aspect of your lower leg. And so it's just like a gnarly little structure that's quite superficial. So it's really susceptible to compression. So you hear stories about people who have like taken a lacrosse ball and they just go over that to get rid of some muscle soreness and then they accidentally overdo it and they compress that nerve. Uh, they get a neuropathy, which slowly recovers over time, right? So the big thing with these is like peripheral neuropathies, whether it's median, whether it's ulnar, whether it's peroneal nerve, slowly recover over time. So this peripheral nervous system has that capability doesn't mean you'll have full recovery, but there is potential for regeneration. So you'd w worry about this person, in fact, if they weren't getting better. But the fact that they have weakness, you'd maybe do some nerve conduction and EMG stuff. You confirm your diagnosis to make sure it's not disc herniation or something else, and it's just a compression one that's most likely going to get better on its own. Okay, so this is drop foot. So you can just quickly recognize that's drop foot. Now I have my differential. Okay, so these features is someone who has like an idiopathic drop foot due to probably, you know, compression, sort of similar to a carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, now case four. So this one person is complaining now of weakness in the hand. There is 65 year old weakness in the right hand, which he woke up with four days ago. Um, he says there is numbness and tingling in the forearm down to the dorsum of his hand. He admits to drinking heavily the night before, wonders if the alcohol was the cause. Weakness with wrist extension, so two to five, so quite weak, right? So only uh, perpendicular to gravity, right? Numbness over the dorsal aspect of the hand and an absent brachioradialis reflex. So what's this called? Saturn and palsy, right? So this is another one of those common ones that you have to recognize. And again, the same feature sort of applies to that drop foot, but there's sort of that classic history of like, you know, more commonly happens when someone is sedated while they're sleeping 
and they don't wake up to their body stimulus telling them like you have nerve compression that's causing numbness, tingling, and pain, and they sleep right through that, and they end up getting quite a severe neuropathy with potentially some weakness. And again, same principles apply. You want to watch this to make sure that it is improving and that you're having potential regeneration and recovery. Okay, so those are the big ones. Now, like what helps you guide this? So really, you just have to have like a general sense of what the dermatomes are doing. Myotomes are confusing enough where I just honestly don't bother remembering them. I have just like some basic principles and tricks to them. But like these classic ones I'll remember. Like I know that Saturday Night Palsy, you'll kind of get wrist drop. I know that the peroneal nerve, you'll get foot drop. And that's pretty much it. Otherwise, you can figure it out based on other characteristics, okay? Um, they can help guide you, but they won't give you a specific answer in my mind just because it's so confusing about like which nerve root goes where. Like do you guys remember the brachial plexus? Yeah, so I remember it, but I don't remember it in detail. Like, who knows? There's like a lot of crisscrossing. It's like a train yard. It's pretty crazy. So there's some general principles that we'll talk about, but in general, I don't find it that helpful. So really, it's these sensory things, and you really have to pick out like the ones that are really important. So whenever someone comes in with a neurological complaint in a family medicine clinic or a general practitioner clinic, you can get away with doing like a much more focused exam, okay? So this is the stuff that is comprehensive enough to cover most of like the cranial nerves and most of the dermatomes that are really important that'll help direct your treatment and help you figure things out. And then if it gets a lot more complicated than this, then you know, you're, you're getting the help of, of someone who's a little bit smarter and experienced than yourself, okay? So we'll just work through this a little bit quickly. So for, for cranial nerve exam, just really quickly, you know, you wanna make sure that the pupils are equal and reactive you know, if you're feeling lucky, you might take a look, and it's important, you might take a look at the, um, the fundus to see if there's any papilledema, okay? You do extraocular eye movement, you do light touch and strength in the face, right? So the three trigeminal areas, and then you make them go like eyebrows down to jaw for different strength exercises. Do palate rise and tongue symmetry, and then you just do sternocleidomastoid and trapezius strength. So that covers, you know, like the big broad categories. Because when you think about the brain, again, like you can think about all the different ways that cranial nerve one, two, three, four, five, all the way through the 12 would potentially present. But remember, like one and two come out of the cortex, three and four are in the midbrain, uh, five to eight are in the pons, and then the medulla is nine to 12, right? So it's like if you test, you know, like 9 and 10 and 12, at least one way, you'd pick up like really gross abnormalities that could be happening in the spinal cord. And then you can just categorize that into like midbrain, pons, <laughs> medulla, okay? And then there's the cerebellar ones, right? So finger to nose, so upper extremity. And then you do rapid alternating movement, which can be upper extremity, right? Back and forth like this. And then the lower extremity too, so like tapping and you can like give someone a beat to tap with to make it a little bit more complicated, or you can just say like go as fast as possible, okay? And you always push people, it's like go faster, go faster, and they're like already messing up, they're going too fast, so go faster. But like that's what you have to do to push people to really find abnormalities. And then the Romberg and gait, right? So the good thing about us is that while we're taking the history, we can assess other things. So again, like I wouldn't get down to the detail of like this person has agnosia on this side, but you just have to get like a general gestalt of like, it seems as though their thought processes is abnormal in some way, right? And you can try and quantify it in like big broad categories. You can say like their executive functioning and planning, their memory, right? Their visuospatial, right? And you have like a few different tests for that. So like memory, I just tell them to remember something, right? And then if you, uh, like you can say a random sentence or a series of numbers, then ask them a few minutes later. And then if it's like their executive functioning or planning, that just becomes very apparent based on asking them about like their day-to-day -day life. And then for memory, or sorry, for uh, visuospatial, you can do like a clock draw, right? So it's like all really simple ways to do that. And then, yeah, so, so a mocha is a, a useful tool, so that might be helpful, but I definitely wouldn't write in like, I'm worried that this person has like, um, what's something that you learn about that's like kind of crazy? like internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Like I would just write like this person's got some weird eye movements, like abnormalities, and I would describe it as best I could. 
to help give them like an idea of what the diagnosis might be for help of triage purposes. But yeah, by no means am I using like really technical terms, right? Like in the hospital, you'll see neurologists who will like bring out like these cards that are like this big and they'll be like, you know, like what's going on in this picture? And then like based on if they like see the person like with the sink overflowing or the person on the ladder who's about to fall over, it like means different things. So like I just don't have time to understand or do that. So you're not expected to have that kind of detail, but you should get a gross impression of like how is this person thinking and can I categorize it broadly into like different faculties of, of mentation. Yeah, and the neurologist will really appreciate that as long as you include detail. Okay, and then you're also, you know, looking for tremor, right, or movement disorders. Like it's very obvious after you speak to someone for a few minutes, they have a tremor that they cannot suppress consciously that you'll notice it either in their hands or their head or torso or neck. That's super common to see with certain movement disorders. And then obviously you're asking them a question so you're gonna appreciate their aphasia, right? So um, categorizing it can sometimes be helpful into like in terms of like uh, fluent aphasia versus just like uh, logopenic, I guess it would be, right? If you can't produce words, right? But they were understanding directions. Those are like the two big categories. So. I can't remember what they are, like expressive and receptive aphasia, just that's it. And then the level of consciousness as well, right? Like they can be kind of drowsy or confused about things and you don't have to do like a formal GCS but you can just get an idea of like, is this someone who has a GCS of 15 or is it like quite a bit less than that? Is it significantly impaired? And then really I just think about it anatomically, right? So there's like big categories. So the upper extremities is something where you need a little bit more detail. And then same with the lower extremities, you need a little bit more detail there as well. In between that, it's just like, you can grossly simplify it. So like the cervical stuff above C5, like who knows, it's like somewhere in the head, controls like some neck muscles, I don't really care. Um, and then C5 to T1 is all the upper extremity stuff. So when it comes to power, just as I've shown there too, so like, you know, the shoulder, like the deltoid and the um, rotator cuff, helps you move your shoulder, right? So that's already like five different muscles that can move your shoulder. And then there's like multiple different nerve roots that contribute to different muscles. And then like some of those muscles might be like this peripheral nerve, some of them might be like this peripheral nerve. So it gets really confusing really fast. So all I say is like, I'm gonna test these things to cover my bases and I'm gonna look for patterns, okay? So weakness is something that is subjective to a certain degree, right? So remember how like five is full strength and then there's four plus, four and four minus. So that's all the subjective stuff, right? So really why that's helpful is not to say like my four plus is the same as your four plus, but it's to say like this shoulder I'm putting as a baseline of four because I don't think it's five. And this shoulder I also don't think is five, but it's probably stronger than the other shoulder. So I'm gonna make that a plus. Or maybe it's a little bit weaker than that four baseline I just made, so I'm gonna make it a minus. So then when you look at the pattern, you can say like, is there just an asymmetry where it's worse on one side? Is it scattered throughout? Is it mostly proximal? Is it mostly distal? And those are the broad patterns that you're worrying about, okay? Where weakness gets a little bit more objective is when it gets lower than that. So if you have weakness, that's three, two, one, or zero. So three being you can only slightly raise it against gravity, but no resistance whatsoever. Two is perpendicular to gravity. One is just a muscle flicker, and zero is like no muscle stimuli at all, seems apparent. Then, uh, then that's like objective weakness, and that's essentially a red flag that needs to be worked up, right? Uh, or you need to, so you need to know the etiology, and so the reason that's important is because some etiologies you're like, okay, you're three out of five right now, which is objective weakness, but I know that this is something that typically recovers with time, so we're gonna do like this management plan, we'll give you this much time. But it, if you don't know what's going on or you think it could be something dangerous and you're not sure it's one of those things that you should reassure about, then for sure you should do extra testing or referral to a specialist, okay? So, the, and then we just tested power. So the ones I always do is shoulder abduction, elbow extension and flexion, wrist extension and flexion, and then I just do uh, digit abduction, okay? So that's all I test, it takes like 15 seconds. And then Reflexes, you should do the biceps, break your abs, and triceps. So it's important to know these numbers, right? But in general, again, it just goes proximal to distal, right, in terms of the nerve roots. So C5, C6 is biceps. There's the overlap with breaker at L's in C6. And then triceps is uh, C7, C8. So you should 
but just have those in your back pocket to help you differentiate common things, right? Because then if you have an absent triceps immediately on the test, you know it's either nerve root C7, C8, or it's the peripheral nerve that contributes uh, to those, right? So for triceps, I think it would be, oh, I don't even know. I don't know what the triceps peripheral nerve is. But the point is, is it helps you localize where it is, okay? And then for touch, so again, right, like you could take a needle or a pin and you could like do fine touch or you could do pain response like over someone's entire body. But when you only have like a few minutes to do a physical exam, then a touch in places that are super high yield, high yield would again be in the upper and the lower extremity. And so what you're doing is you're just touching in the places where all the new verts could be. And again, that has overlap with the specific peripheral nerves, right? So C5 is the lateral elbow in anatomic position. C6 is potentially these two fingers, right? Makes a six, so that's how you remember it. However you make a six with that, it's kind of awkward, but that's like my memory technique. And it's for sure going to be the thumb, right? And so when you touch over the first interweb space on the dorsal side, you're testing the radial nerve as well as C6, okay? And then when you touch on the palm of the third digit, you're for sure testing median. Ulnar never goes to the third digit. And you're also testing C7. C7 is always the middle finger, okay? And then C8 is always the pinky, and that's the ulnar nerve as well. So you just touch the lateral side. And then again, you touch the medial side in anatomic position to test T1, okay? So you've tested all the peripheral nerves. You've tested all the nerve roots. And then if you see numbness in one of those areas, you just label it as that. And then if you're like being a neurologist, you'd go into more detail. But this is just the screening exam that we would commonly do. Now, remember spinal levels as well. So if someone has like symptoms here and down, it seems. So they have like all lower extremity symptoms or they have like bilateral symptoms in upper and lower extremities, then you're looking for that spinal level. And that's when you'll actually do some like fine touch along here. And you're looking for above this level is normal, below this level is abnormal in whatever way, okay? And then we move down to the lower extremities. So again, the big things to remember is L2 to S1. So remember, this is the cauda equina of the spine. It usually ends around T12, L1. So you know we're worried about trauma in this area. So whenever you have someone who has symptoms when you're lower extremity testing, you also have to, f don't forget about asking about the cauda equina symptoms like bowel and bladder incontinence, saddle anesthesia, anal tone, the anal wink, okay? Do all those things. So again, those are just like simply categorized into power, reflexes, and touch. Okay, so for me, I do a cranial nerve exam. I do this really quick peripheral exam where I do like whatever it is they're complaining about. So a quick upper extremity, a quick lower extremity, or if they have like a level, then I quickly try and find that level to figure out where it is. Okay, um, so it makes the, the physical exam pretty quick. And the big ones that you should highlight, so remember again, what's like the most common ones? So L5 and S1. So if you just move down those things, and again, maybe power would be a little bit more helpful to remember which ones are affected by L5 and S1. So remember, L5 is similar to foot drop, so dorsiflexion, and usually eversion would be the ones that are mainly affected. And then S1, you know, has all your calf muscles innervated, so that's plantar flexion, right, going on your tippy toes. So we test those things just through functionally testing them by doing a heel and a toe walk. So you don't actually have to sit someone down for the lower extremity power testing, where I would do like, you know, hip flexion, knee extension, knee flexion, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, first big toe extension or dorsiflexion. Um, you can also just say like, why don't you get up and walk? Why don't you walk on your heels? Why don't you walk on your toes? Why don't you do a squat? And if all of that's normal and they don't struggle with that at all, I wouldn't even do any further testing, okay? That's like quite a bit of load and, and stress and test on those muscles. Uh, probably better than you would be able to pick up by just individually localizing them. Now, if they're abnormal, you have to go to your individual, individual localization of the myotomes, and you have to do those ones, and you have to, again, just get a general pattern. So is there weakness only on one side? Is it more distal? Is it more proximal? Am I seeing those classic patterns of just dorsiflexion and eversion, just plantar flexion? Because that would make me think L5, S1, okay? And then the reduced ankle jerk for S1 is important. And then also the places that we touch on the lower extremity. So again, for L4, medial malleolus, then first interweb space of the big toe, and then the lateral foot, right? Like over the metatarsal of the lateral fifth digit. 
and those are the places that cover the L5S1 and L4. And you don't really have to worry about the peripheral nerves as well. We covered like the main one that would primarily get affected, which is the peroneal nerve. It's the most common peripheral neuropathy in the lower extremity. So we already talked about that. So this is your approach, right? So this will pick up most things that you'll see in a primary care office to either say like, I know the diagnosis, or I can at least categorize it into something that seems quite common and typical and ridiculous and peripheral, or is more complex than that and has more widespread issues, right? So like if we all of a sudden started seeing like weakness, you know, asymmetrically in multiple areas, and then there's fasciculations, we're automatically thinking like ALS, right? So, so this is a scheme that helps you differentiate broadly into like, you know, common peripheral or radicular neuropathies versus other more complex neurological stuff which you guys have learned about. Okay. So let's just jump into a case now. We're gonna move away from the peripheral neuropathy. So this is a headache case. So this is a 29 year old female that presents with new onset headache. She states that the headache started three days ago. She has been vomiting intermittently since it started. She has also spent those three days laying in a dark room. She has no appetite. She is sensitive to light and sound. She has had normal headaches before this, but this is the worst of her life. The headache is bilateral over her temples and she describes it as stabbing. Her previous medical history is just some, just obesity, and then her only medication is OCP, okay? Nothing else really pertinent comes up. So I want you to spend like a couple minutes just talking to your neighbor. I want you to think like, okay, what about this patient makes me think primary versus secondary? Or what's most likely, right? Like what's the top thing? And then also what's the things that I wanna rule out that are most dangerous, right? So we're making just like a short differential for this patient of things that we'd be worried about that would be secondary causes and why we're thinking that. And then what's the most likely primary cause and why would we be thinking that, like what features make us think that? Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to discuss. So go ahead, guys. So there's the info just to remind you. All right, so uh, I'll let you just kind of wrap up your final thoughts. All right, so, so we, got, we have a young female, right? So, so right away it's like you want, you're tempted to say this, this isn't cancer, but it's still on the differential because it's something we don't want to miss, right? It falls into that category. 
but it's a young female, so we're obviously thinking that primary is more likely than secondary, okay, right away. New onset, though, so that's considered a red flag. She describes it as the worst in her life, so also considered a red flag, right? So kind of like the weaker ones. Um, and she's been vomiting, okay, so we want to characterize that, like what type of vomiting is it, okay? She's like just nauseous and like sort of, you know, has vomited once or twice over the past three days. It's less of a concern when someone has like intractable vomiting that they've taken stuff for and it's not helping and it's projectile. Like that's the stuff that gets you really worried. So we want to know more about that. Um, also, she spent three days laying in the dark room. So, you know, she's sensitive to light and sound. So she has the phobias, the sensitivities, which again, lots of times is tempting just to think that that is, you know, a, a migraine, right? Those sensitivities are very common. But don't forget with meningismus, so meningismus, I'm not sure this has been explained to you, but meningismus is the clinical signs of meningitis, okay? So meningismus actually has a differential within itself, and meningitis is the top one that you would re be really worried about, but it can be other things that cause it, like people who get a subarachnoid hemorrhage also get meningismus, potentially, some of these symptoms, but someone who has all the meningismus features would be someone who has a, you know, s headache, they're sensitive to light, okay, and they have a stiff neck, and movement of the neck greatly exacerbates their pain, okay? And then if it's an infectious etiology, they would also have a fever, right? So we want to ask this patient about that, right? We want to do that on physical exam and look for those signs, and we want to ask them on history about those signs, for sure. Um, she's had normal headaches before, okay? So when someone describes headaches as, as normal, uh, they're usually pretty mild, right? Because moderate to severe headaches are never considered normal to us or the person experiencing them. They suck. So she probably was having tension type headaches. So this is a little different than that one, it seems. But we'd want to go into, like, what was the features? Is there anything that was consistent? How different is it, right? Maybe this is quite similar characteristics as your previous headaches, but this is just more severe for whatever reason. And that would be really reassuring, right? Because then she's already proven that this type of headache for her is a benign headache, which she makes a full recovery from, right? So it increases the odds that this is something benign that she's had before. And then she describes, or she says it's bilateral of her temples. So like remember, like don't put too much stock. Pain is such a complex sensation that people can be like, it's stabbing, it's throbbing, it feels like someone hit me in the head with a rock, it feels like there's ants in my head, it feels like there's hornets in my head. Like they can describe it in many different ways and they're not particularly helpful, but if it is like a classic description and it's consistent, it can just help, you know, be more evidence towards what you're thinking. So for this person, like bilateral over her temples and describes it as stabbing, I would just say like that's not particularly helpful. I'm not gonna push her on it. I'm not gonna be like, no, you have to describe it in one of these three ways, right? So you just leave it at that and you look at the other characteristics. She's obese and on the OCP, so those would be risk factors for which condition. Anyone know? What if she was also on retinoic acid? Pseudotumor cerebri, right? So think of the young female in college who comes in with a new onset headache with intractable vomiting, papilla edema, is obese, is on retinoic acid and OCP. That would be your classic high risk patient for uh, pseudotumor cerebri or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, okay? Which the diagnosis would be made through an LP, right? So that's a big thing that you have to potentially rule in or rule out based on your history and physical because your decision making process is the next step, does this person need an LP or not to rule in or rule out that. So if you can't do it on physical and history, you're subjecting this person to an LP which is not you know, like an innocuous procedure or innocuous procedure. So it's a, it's a big deal to, to understand that diagnosis well, okay? so. We, we covered the thing, so what would be a differential for this patient? We didn't talk about the primary things, but I touched on it a little bit. So migraine would be the biggest one, right? She's the right demographic, and we'll get into that. And then the other things that you can't miss, right? Brain tumor, right? So you're still looking for red flags of like inter increased intracranial pressure from things like a brain tumor or idiopathically with pseudotumor cerebri. We're looking at meningitis. At any age, people can get meningitis. It's actually quite common. Like I just found out that like my dad's buddy had like a severe meningitis. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So it's like, it's actually like, it happens to real people. It's like very 
very common presentation. So it's one that you always have to think about. Um, so those would be like the big three red flags for this patient, I would say. And then like you'd be worried about vascular things like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but again, super unlikely in this patient. So you maybe would keep it on your list just because it's something you potentially don't want to miss. Okay, so the point is, is there's lots of etiologies, so you should try and narrow it down and run through the pertinent positives and negatives of a case. So this is kind of overwhelming, but you should just have in mind, like, here's the primary ones. You should have those down pat, like what the classic is, and we go through those in detail soon. And then you should also go through, like, the big categories of secondary causes. So, like, vascular, okay, so, like, temporal arteritis, right? Like, what are the big key features of that that would make me worried? And we'll talk about that in a bit. You know, hemorrhage when it comes to vascular infections, you really cannot miss a meningitis. Okay, so meningismus with fever, right? So the clinical signs of meningitis plus fever would make you worry about an infectious meningitis. Um, high ICP, so we'll talk about the features of that. And again, the big worrisome ones would be a mass, an abscess, hypertension can raise that, and then the pseudotumor cerebri. Trauma, right? So whenever someone comes in in the context of trauma, that obviously changes things if they have a headache. Um, and then systemic things, like, don't forget there, like, is other broad things. So I wouldn't worry about, like, systemic or other things showing up on your test. But remember, in real life, that there is a huge differential. The point is, is when you're in primary care, you actually have to kind of be a headache expert. You know, you don't have to know, like, the really complex treatments. But you have to know, like, how do I differentiate these 20 things from each other, okay? So I always say primary and secondary. And I don't ask about specific things unless I'm really worried about them. So for this patient, I would ask about specific things of meningitis, pseudotumor cerebri, and brain tumor, because I don't want to miss those things for sure. But what can cover you, a, a shortcut to it, is just asking about the red flags, right? So we're going to kind of demystify the red flags going forward. So first, let's focus on the primary stuff, because you guys got to have this down pat. So this is a migraine. So its prevalence is 10%. So remember. Anything that's like 5 to 15 to 20% common in the population will show up on your test multiple times because you're going to see it no matter where you practice or what you practice. Okay, the classic onset is age 10 to 30. So this patient was 29 years old, so they fit within that. And female is quite a bit more predominant than male. Okay, so female, middle aged, you know, very common. That's what I would know about the epidemiology of this disease. And then the diagnostic criteria. So more than or equal than five episodes, four hours to three days is a typical episode. But for, remember, that's like the 99% confidence intervals. Some people can have a little bit shorter. And some people can have migraines that are chronic that go on for weeks or months and are very hard to break, even with like strong therapy. Okay, It has to have two of the following. So unilateral, right? So this patient was a little bit atypical. Pulsating slash pounding. Okay, So when someone describes something as stabbing, over and over again, you know, I just basically say, like, that's another word of saying pulsating slash pounding. So kind of be flexible in that. And then moderate to severe pain. So this person's been, like, you know, taken out by this thing laying in their room. So that definitely meets that. And then worse with activity, as she described as well. And then one of the following, she has nausea and vomiting, and she has photophobia. So she doesn't meet criteria for migraine, but what she's having is most likely the first migraine of her life. And if she goes on to have four more that are similar and fit these characteristics, she can be diagnosed with migraine. Okay, So you're like, this is a migraine, potentially, but I can't diagnose this person with migraine disorder because she doesn't meet the criteria solely based on this is her first migraine. Okay, So what are some of the other things you should be thinking about with migraine is you should always think about aura, right? Because this can help you say, like, OK, this is for sure a migraine. So a quarter of migraines have aura, so that means not all of them, right? So keep that in mind too. But a classic aura um, uh, is 60 minutes before your headache. So it comes on before. It's a bit of a warning system. And we don't know why it happens, but it's got that like um, classic pattern of, of depolarization that goes along the cortex surface, right? And there's like some buzzwords around that. And that's like all the pathophysiology about a migraine you should know. It's actually quite complex. People used to think that there was a vascular, like predominantly a vascular component. And we know that that plays a role, but it's probably not the only predominant one. There's like actually multiple complex multifactorial uh, contributions to why people get migraines. And then don't forget, like the classic aura is, is the one that you'll hear most commonly of. And the common ones is, um, you know, 
some numbness, some tingling, maybe even some localized weakness, and then the visual auras as well. Uh, those are the most common, actually. But you can get pretty much anything. So complicated auras that you should be thinking about is basilar auras. So that's things where they get basically like uh, cranial nerve involvement in their aura. So they have uh, an occipital headache, most commonly. And then they have like all those Ds. They have diplopia, dizziness, dysmetria, which is another word for ataxia, right? But just when it's seen in the extremities. And then they could have an altered level of consciousness evenly. Remember, the brain stem is the most basic part of the brain. So when you mess with it in any way, you get like some, some very basic uh, physiological functions that are affected, including like how awake you are, right? Like how fast or slow are you breathing? Like how fast or slow is your heart rate? So remember that that stuff can, can happen even within a headache uh, and it can be due to an aura. But you would still wanna see that classic temporal pattern of an aura that lasts, you know, somewhere in the range of minutes to an hour or so, like over 30 minutes is kind of atypical, I think, with aura. And then 60 minutes later, within 60 minutes, they start having the headache, okay? Sometimes the headache starts with their aura and then their aura dissipates and their headache progresses, okay? Those would be like common things. But remember, like really anything is possible. I saw someone who had a, an aura with a migraine where they had hemiplegia and hemisensory loss, like dense, like they just collapsed. But then it slowly regained function and then they had a bad headache after. And guess what, that person was like 70 years old. They were a farm that lived out in rural Alberta. And they had to come to Foothills Hospital every single time that happened, because guess what, that could also be a stroke. That person's totally at risk for a stroke. And in those first few minutes when that happens, you don't know if they're having an acute MCA stroke or if this is just another migraine with a complex aura, right? So that's, that's how these patients are managed. So remember, it could be migraine, even with these really abnormal neurological symptoms, but it would have to fit the classic pattern, and you would still, every single time, want to rule out the more dangerous causes, okay? And remember that you can get an aura with no headache, but it's quite rare, okay? Those are the patients that take forever to figure out, right? They come in with, like, diplopia and dizziness that lasts for 60 minutes and then goes away, but they have, like, no other features of the other causes of dizziness or diplopia, and they have no headaches, so you're like, what the heck is going on? So you gotta send them to a smart neurologist. So remember that the big thing about these patients is that their migraines get triggered. So classic ones would be things like stress. So that would be like emotional or psychological stress, but also physical stress as well. So like a lack of sleep, drinking alcohol, um, caffeine, commonly associated with headaches. These are all triggers for primary headaches, including migraines. So what are the key differences between a tension and a cluster headache, which are the other two primary ones that you should definitely know? So location can be helpful. So remember, tension headache is more likely bilateral, usually frontal occipital. They'll classically say, like, I have tense muscles in my neck, and the pain radiates up from the back towards the top of my head frontally. Um, it's constant, right? So there's not that throbbing, pounding, stabbing uh, component. It's usually mild to moderate. So usually these people, what they'll say, is that I have a headache, but I can go to work, and it doesn't get worse, it's just annoying, okay? But someone with a migraine tries to go to work, and they all of a sudden get worse. Their headache gets worse, more pain, they're nauseous, now they're vomiting, and they have to go rest, okay? So that's a big question that can help differentiate whether this could be tension or migraine. And then duration is a little bit different, but it varies a lot. Sometimes it can be short, just a few minutes at the end of the day, or it can last for days as well and become chronic. Really, what you're looking for is like no associated features, so like no aura, okay, no neurological symptoms. And then cluster headaches are an interesting uh, phenomenon that happen, and they're a little more rare, but you should know about them. So again, these are unilateral, classically retroorbital, so like they'll present more with eye pain. So you might read a question about this on the stem, you might be like, this is an ophthalmology question. But remember, you should also be thinking of like these cluster headaches. Um, it's stabbing and people who describe it as stabbing because it's super severe, okay? So like they get knocked out and they're, they're also called suicide headaches because um, people like are, are, are considering, you know, suicide because of the severity of the pain. Um, and then the most classic thing that would help you is that they're usually shorter, right? They usually happen in the evenings. People are like just, just in antagonized, like just terrible pain for, few hours, 
um, at their wit's end, and then they have autonomic symptoms. So autonomic symptoms of the face is what I'm talking about. So that'd be like tearing, it'd be like rhinorrhea, it would be sweating, usually unilateral, but can be on both sides, and that's pretty classic. So if you hear those buzzwords, you're thinking cluster headache. Okay, something that can be helpful uh, for you, potentially, is this, is this in clinical practice for sure, is a quick screening tool that has really good sensitivity and specificity, and I have the positive predictive value put there for a migraine. So you're asking about three things, so pinsophotophobia, right, but also include like other sensitivities, like are they sensitive to other senses? So not only light or sight, but also sound, taste, touch, smell, those can be sensitivities that can happen with a migraine. And then impairment, again, that big differentiating feature, like what do you do, I always ask like, what do you do when you have a headache, or what can't you do? And if they're saying like, I can't go to work, or I can't leave my room, I can't turn on the lights, or I go and hide in a dark room, that's like very, very specific and worrisome for a migraine. And then the nausea as well. So if they have two of those three, 92% chance that they have a migraine, and then if they have all three, there's a 97% chance, right? So this patient had all three of those things. So again, that's really reassuring that this is a primary headache, okay? But our job isn't done, okay? So we now know what primary headaches look like, classically, but we also still have to take like quite a comprehensive history. So this just goes through all of the things that you have to ask about, and again, you can categorize it into different things that actually makes it fairly reasonable. So with pain, right, a headache is pain, so you have to characterize that pain so the biggest thing is just like going through whatever you use, like old cart, Socrates, and just getting a good timeline of that pain, what makes it worse, what makes it better. And there's a couple key ones that you for sure should ask about. So onset, so thunderclap. So thunderclap means that the headache gets to its greatest intensity within seconds, okay? So commonly, uh, this happens all the time in the ED, like the triage nurse will say, this is a thunderclap headache. And I've been like, oh no, you've been waiting five hours to see me. So I run over there. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? I hear you have a headache. Like, when did this start? And they say, like, oh, four hours ago. I'm like, did it come on just like that out of nowhere? And they're like, yes. I'm like, okay. So what was the highest intensity of your headache? And they're like, it's worst right now. I was like, so when it first started, it was better than this. They're like, yes, much better. So right away, my timeline now is like their pain was pretty high, but it's getting slowly and slowly worse, right? And the maximum intensity is like way down the road, right? So that's not a thunderclap headache. Okay, so that's important to know. And then the exacerbating things, the things that you should always talk about is things that raise your intracranial pressure that you do every day. So coughing, laying down, um, Valsalva, while you're having a bowel movement, ask about those things for sure. And then you wanna ask about the vomiting and characterize it, like how much are you vomiting? Have you tried to take anything for it? So was it intractable and was it projectile? Those are the big ones. Jaw claudication, right? That's a big one for temporal arteritis. Um, visual deficits, right? So remember an aura can cause some visual deficits potentially, but it should be gone from the migraine. So if someone's showing up with you with a headache that they've had for more than 30 minutes, then you know any visual deficits would be a red flag. And then weakness and numbness. So you're asking them about like these general neurological symptoms as well, okay? Remember new or different is a red flag, but a red flag doesn't mean that you like have to do imaging or that this isn't a migraine. This person has red flags of the case that we just did. But in the context of it being likely a migraine, because it fits so classically with it, and then ruling out some of these other things with a comprehensive history and physical, you can avoid imaging, right? So this person does not need imaging, despite us having some scary things on the differential, okay? Trauma, again, always red flag. That really changes things, right? Whenever you have trauma, you're worried about a bleed, and you're worried about just like structural damage in some sense, so they should probably get some head imaging if they have a headache or any other suspicious features. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so classically, the things that would give it away is, remember a migraine, your intracranial pressure is normal, and then pseudotumor cerebri, your intracranial pressure is raised. So it's really the things that are different between those two. So high ICP symptoms, the most common thing would be papilledema on exam, and then also intractable vomiting, that's projectile, okay? In real life, those, it's hard to do that on physical exam, and it's hard to get a like, really reliable history of whether it's projectile or not, so it's very difficult, but on your exam, they'll definitely give you those two hints. 
All right, so then medications, like don't forget to ask about medication, it's not a red flag, but medication overuse is a different sort of subset or complication, I would say, of a primary headache, so you have to ask about that. And then you have to ask about their previous medical history. Remember hypertension, so the hypertensive encephalopathy that increases your ICP could potentially be causing it. So you want to know, like, do you have hypertension? Are you hypertensive now? You want to, you know, ask about malignancy in their personal and family history. And then any neurological symptoms or syndromes or conditions they've been diagnosed in the past, that complicates the picture. So if someone comes in with, like, a first episode of migraine and they also have a diagnosis of MS, that just changes things, like, quite drastically, right? So you would have to get the help of an expert and potentially, you know, do, be more thorough than, than what I'm explaining right now. And then the family history, again, uh, uh, primary brain tumors, and then other migraines is the big one, right? When they say, like, oh, yeah, my mom gets migraines, and my sister gets migraines, and my brother gets migraines, and my grandma got migraines, like, that's really helpful, okay? Any of these red flags, you're thinking that this is suggestive of a secondary etiology, so those right-sided categories on that slide and not a primary thing. You need to do further testing dependent on what it is you think is going on for a secondary cause. So something that can help you is the 543210. So whenever you're talking to a patient, you should like go through those in your head, right? So five episodes, okay? Four hours to three days. You need two of the primary symptoms and there's four of them. So that's where the sultans comes up. So S is severe. UL is unilateral, T is throbbing, and A is activity limiting, okay? And then you need one of the two of the last ones, so N is nausea and vomiting, and S is sensitivity, so phobias, okay? And then zero is they need zero red flags. So all of these things that I've highlighted are things you have to for sure ask about. So if it's thunderclap, if they have high ICP, right, like laying down, Valsalva, coughing, if they have other neurological symptoms like numbness, tingling, weakness, if they have intractable vomiting, if it's new or different, if there's trauma associated, or they have really scary personal or family history things like cancers, hypertension, weird neurological diseases. Okay, that's it. That's all you have to ask about. So then on physical exam, there's a few things that you just have to for sure cover. So everyone with a new onset headache, all that means is you have to do a comprehensive physical exam to make sure there's no red flags. And so the first thing to do is vitals, right? Remember, that, that greatly changes things. Like, if they have, you know, if they're hypotensive with tachycardia, like, this isn't a primary headache, okay? Super unlikely. If they have a fever, again, you're really worried about meningitis. So you always have to take a full vitals from someone with a new headache. And then you want to do some MSK stuff, right? So again, this is mainly to rule out some of those things like meningitis. So there's like the Koenigs and the Brodzinskis, and those are fancy names with like very specific ways to do it. But all you're doing is you're stressing and putting tension on the neuroaxis, right? So you're making the covering of the neuroaxis move relative to their movement. So you could just say to someone like, sit up in bed. You can grab their head and rotate it around and flex it and extend it. And if that drastically makes their headache worse, then that's positive, right? And also don't forget, like sometimes people can have, you know, like, just degenerative disease in their cervical spine, and that could be what's causing their pain, so you have to do a bit of an MSK head and neck exam. Now, the really important things is that you have to do a full neurological exam, which should be normal. These primary ones really don't have abnormal ones, unless they have one of those really complicated auras that you're still seeing present. But again, usually those will be resolved by the time you see them. So really any of these things. So the big ones, again, is like altered level of consciousness. So like just general gestalt, that shouldn't happen with a primary headache. And then papilledema as well is the other big one. And then you do have to be thorough. So you would do that sort of screening exam I explained in an earlier slide of the motor, the sensory, the reflexes, and check out their gait. And if there's anything that's severely abnormal, that would make you want to go down that secondary cause. Okay, investigations. So the good thing about investigations, routinely you don't need any investigations. So a headache is a clinical diagnosis unless you're thinking it's secondary and you have red flags present, then you need to do imaging. So the big thing to keep in mind is that CT is really only in specific circumstances, like with trauma, because you can get it a little bit faster and you can see those bleeds quite easily, but really someone needs an MRI. So if you're seeing someone in an outpatient, it's kind of tough because then you have to make that decision. Like if they're highly likely to have something like meningitis or a brain tumor, you're sending them to the ED, 
but you really have to make a decision like, okay, are we going to go down the MRI route and wait like six months to get it? Because that's really what's most helpful. And if you're worried about infection, don't forget, like you have to do your CBC, antibiotics, you have to do an LP. If you're worried about pseudotumor cerebi, you have to do an LP. If you're worried about temporal arteritis, you would do ESR and CRP. Okay, those are the next steps in investigations. So in general, you need an MRI. Uh, unless it's an infection, then you can just do blood work and an LP. Or unless it's temporal arteritis, highly suspicious for that. And then you can just do an ESR and CRP, and that can diagnose it. Okay. So that's it. So now let's go to treatment of a primary headache. So number one, again, I, I, I think I've taught some of you guys this, this management plan approach. So number one is always educate the patient, right? That's why all doctors are teachers, because you need to tell the patient, like, this is what you have, okay? Do you understand that? Okay, this is what happens when you have this, okay? Do you understand that? And then this is what we can do about it, okay? Because if you don't do that, and you just say to a patient, like, by the way, Here's our pill, so you're skipping step one, you're going to step two, it'll help your headaches. The chances that they're gonna be compliant or use that properly are extremely low. So you have to spend a lot of time educating the patient, especially with something like migraines, okay? So you really have to say like, this is the natural history. Remember those triggers we talked about? Make people aware of those. Like if you don't get enough sleep, if you're stressed, if you have lots of caffeine, if you drink a lot of wine, you can have triggers, and these triggers can be like any physiological or personal stressor. So it's like find the triggers that are specific to you and then manage them. Avoid them or reduce their frequency, okay? Acute management as well, like, so like what happens when you know a headache is coming on, which is super helpful when someone has an aura because they know. Medication overuse, you have to tell them like you have to use these medications appropriately. So medication overuse would be with the strong stuff. So strong stuff is opioids and triptans for headaches or migraines. If you're using that more than half the day, so 15 times in a month, then you're at risk for medication overuse headache. And then the weaker stuff, so like NSAIDs, Tylenol, if you're using that more than two thirds of the day, so more than 20 days in a month, then you're at risk for a medication overuse headache, okay? Pharmacotherapy, so remember, there's two different types, so two big branches, so acute therapy, like you have a headache, it's either coming on or you know it's coming on, you can sense it, you can feel it, you have an aura. That really just depends on what the patient responds to. So, it's never harmful to give someone acetaminophen if it's not contraindicated, and it's never harmful to give someone NSAIDs, right? And you can go a little bit stronger, and specific NSAIDs may be helpful for specific primary headaches. So what specific primary headaches do you guys know about where there's only one NSAID that typically works for it? So it's on one side, headache doesn't respond to any other treatment, it's chronic, so it's there and it just stays until you treat it usually. It's quite severe, it's unilateral throbbing. So it's called hemicrania continua. Okay, so it's like a, it's sort of like a branch of migraines. And the only thing that responds to it in terms of NSAIDs is indomethacin. So if you've seen someone who's had a unilateral headache for three months and they've, you're the fourth doctor they're seeing, if they haven't trialed indomethacin at least once, you should give them indomethacin. Okay, so that's one little small like factoid that's actually kind of useful. And then triptans is another acute management, right? So again, you take it early, right? And you hope to abort the migraine. You can repeat dosing, but generally speaking, like you just have one shot at it. And the earlier you take it in that headache, the better chance of it is of aborting the migraine. So someone has an aura, as soon as they feel that aura, they should be reaching for that triptan and take one, and hopefully they avoid the migraine, the actual pain, okay? Now, when someone has a lot of headaches, and again, I think there's like some cutoffs, but generally speaking, this is like patient-centered. So it's like if someone's having too many headaches and their acute management isn't um, sufficient for them to keep their functioning well. So like I usually say, like if someone's having more than one headache a week, like think about a week. Every single week, could you imagine doing medical school where you had a migraine that took you out of commission for somewhere in the range of like half a day to three days and you had to lay in bed? Like that's, that's just not compatible with high functioning life, right? So even as low as like four migraines a month or three migraines a month, if they're bad enough and last long enough and impairing enough, we can do prophylactic treatment so we can stop them. That's secondary prevention of headaches, right? So the prophylaxis, the big categories that you guys should know is beta blockers is commonly used, calcium channel blockers, TCAs, and then like anticonvulsants are used as well, okay? Now, 
tension headaches change a little bit, so the key differences are that it's mainly conservative again, so counseling them on like, this is why you're getting things. Here's some conservative pain strategies that you can use, like heat, massage, relaxation techniques. They can all be helpful. And then pharmacological, usually they respond pretty well to over-the-counter, and sometimes you can go to prescription TCAs, but generally not needed. Okay, and then cluster headaches. This is really complex. The big take-home point is that there's not great treatment for them. So triptans can sometimes work. There's like oxygen therapy that sometimes work. And the prophylaxis, again, what I would say is like there's very specific prophylaxis, which is different from the prophylaxis from migraines, and it's usually like heavier drugs. So you guys may not appreciate this right now, but if someone told me I had to go on lithium or if I had to go on prednisolone, I'd be like, no way, I'm not going on that medication. Way too many really bad side effects. But if this person is having these cluster headaches, remember suicide headaches, like frequently and common, then um, it, it definitely is something that they could potentially pursue. Okay, so just understand that it's complex management, but there's acute options and prophylactic options for cluster headaches as well. Okay, so how can we summarize this for you for the test for something you can remember? That's like the thing you've already learned, which is SNOOP, right? So if we just go through this quickly, like systemic symptoms, so fever, worried about infection. Weight loss, you're worried about like some sort of chronic, insidious, dangerous cause, like a brain tumor or a known malignancy, right? So those are the systemic things I think about. Neurological symptoms, so any focal weakness, numbness, tingling, visual deficits, altered level of consciousness. Those are weird. That's not consistent with a primary headache, okay? Uh, and then... Lastly, the onset, so thunderclap, and the new type of headache. And like, I really want to just take that out because again, like, someone has to have a new type of headache at some point, right? So that doesn't mean that you need imaging. It just means you have to be very thorough and rule out in your history and physical, like what we just went through, the dangerous secondary causes. Older age, remember the most common for a migraine was like 10 to 30, and then tension headaches kind of, you know, can be throughout life. but. The real numbers that you should remember is like less than five years old and then greater than 50. So if this patient was 51 years old and came in with a new migraine, even if they had no red flags, I'd probably send them for imaging, just non-urgently. I'd be like, it's kind of weird that you got a migraine at 50 and most likely it's still just primary and there's no secondary cause. But because the chances of a secondary cause are just a little bit higher with you, I'm probably gonna do a brain MR and it doesn't have to be urgent, but at some point I'm gonna get it. Okay, so that'd be an instance where maybe I would pursue an MRI. Um, and then pressure, so projectile vomiting, papilledema, worse in the morning, worse when laying down, worse with coughing, or Valsalva. That's the stuff that'll separate um, migraine from pseudotumor cerebri, okay? And then persistent or progressive, right? So again, persistent just means that it's gone beyond that typical three days or days that you expect with like a tension or a migraine headache. And if it's getting worse and worse and worse, then that's also a red flag, right? Because it's just progressing. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Sorry, can you, can you repeat that question? I just missed the phone. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's two possible options, right? So when, remember those complex orders we talked about. First of all, they're rare, right? So whenever we saw neurological symptoms, we should assume it's secondary, right? But something that would make us reassured and poten think, potentially think this is a migraine aura would be like it's now resolved, and when I do my neurological examination, everything is normal, and I have that classic pattern where they had the aura, didn't last like a crazy amount of time, right? It was like that 30-minute range, right? Um, and then after that, they had a severe headache that's consistent with a migraine-type pain headache. So if you had all of that, you could maybe tell yourself, but generally speaking, most doctors, like, like I said with that patient who had hemiplegia and hemisensory loss that has a complete overlap with an MCA stroke, they're gonna get imaging probably every single time. Or at the very least, they're gonna get neurological consultation to say, like, come do a really good neuro exam and come do a really good history for a migraine so that we can be reassured this isn't a secondary thing. So there's caveats to it, but in general, on the test and in real life, these neurological symptoms are a red flag that need to be investigated, usually with imaging, and sometimes in very rare occasions if it's a classic fit for a complex aura, 
then you could potentially do that. The main reason I say these things to you is just so that when you see someone in real life and it's like, oh, they just have like this weird aura that I've never heard of, you can be like, oh no, I've heard of this before. It's possible, but it's incredibly rare. Awesome, good question. Any other questions before I move on? So, uh, do you guys want a break? Okay, why don't we take like a five minute break and we'll let you guys like go to the washroom and grab some stuff and then once most people have come back and settled, we'll start again. So five, 10 minutes and then we'll quickly move on. And if you have questions about the first half, come on up and uh, ask me.
Okay, so let's get started. So we have uh, we have 40 minutes left. So I actually think we'll probably just go like straight to 12:30, but I'll, I'll try not to go over um, at all. And then, of course, I'm, I'm happy to stay a little bit later um, to answer any questions. So one really good question. Uh, oh, I got a few really good questions, but I think one is actually important enough just to state to the whole to the whole room because this might come up on your test. So the question was about when we do an LP, because we're worried about, say, pseudotumor cerebri, or we see signs of intracranial, increased intracranial pressure, it's like, well, isn't there a risk of herniation? And you're totally right. So don't forget that if you are seeing signs of high CP, a precondition to doing the LP is to do a CT scan of the head. And remember, all that that CT scan does is rules out the things that can cause a herniation which is a focal brain lesion. So like think of like a big mass, right? And that can push down and cause your like subtetorial or your uncle herniation, which patients can die from. So that's why it's really important to make sure you do that CT scan. But the good thing is, is if you don't see any big focal mass, if you have one of these other conditions that can raise your ICP, like pseudotumor cerebri, it's safe to do the LP and there's no risk of herniation, okay? So that's why you have to do that LP. But if it's normal, it still allows you now to do the LP for those other things that could be explaining why you see high intracranial pressure on exam. Okay, so that's a good concept, important concept. All right, so now we're gonna go to a vertigo, aka Dizinius case. So um, I'll read it quickly. So 58 year male presents with vertigo. Let's say this is urgent care. He states that this vertigo episode started the day before and he has been dizzy ever since. He denies any visual disturbance. He has been nauseous since the onset of the vertigo and has vomited three times. He denies any tinnitus. He had a similar episode twice before a few months ago while laying in bed. It lasted for less than a few minutes and he had a full recovery shortly thereafter. He did not vomit during these previous episodes but did feel nauseous. So he has a previous medical history of hypertension, dyslipidemia. His meds are a statin and hydrochlorothiazide for his hypertension. His vitals are normal that you see before you go into the room. And then just from outside the room you can kind of see him. He's like puking into one of those basins Looks like he's like mentating well, like he's kind of like swearing at his partner who's in the room. He's kind of saying like, this sucks so much. He's looking pretty pale and is a little diaphoretic. So like, you know, not looking great. Like, can you imagine what that person looks like, right? So it's kind of like when you walk in on someone, you're like, okay, I'm gonna take a few steps back because you look like infectious almost or not, too, not doing too well, okay? So big thing, so I want you guys to, again to discuss just for a few minutes. Uh, what, what, what would you do on physical exam for this patient? What do you need to do? What's the most likely cause? And then what is the most dangerous causes of his vertigo? So remember this was a, a lecture that um, had a lot of different things that I chatted about, but like, let's see, talk to your neighbor and see if you were able to pull out some like really good pertinent stuff. So I'll give you guys, uh, again, a, a few minutes to talk here. Okay, so go ahead.
So I'll just give you guys a few seconds to say your final thoughts. So I'm just, I'm just curious, to, how many of you guys think you have a, a good approach to vertigo? Any Anyone out there? Okay, so I'm going to try and simplify things for you, which is like a helpful approach in general to categorize things and also for primary care. So the, the biggest thing is, is vertigo is dizziness and dizziness is vertigo. You are, cannot separate them. Patients cannot separate them uh, reliably on history. So they've done studies on this. So just don't even bother. The other thing is, you know, who cares what it feels like? So like you spend so much wasted time being like, does it feel like you're on a boat? Does it feel like you've just gone on a merry-go-round? Like who cares? Um, if a patient says they have vertigo or they have dizziness, they have it. Okay, and you can just come close together and, and use the same approach that I'll tell you about. Um, so important things with this patient is that, you know, it's been going on for quite some time, started the day before. So that's, you know, one of the more worrisome things. But he's got this acute episode. The other thing is that some specific features he doesn't have is tinnitus. Um, you know, he doesn't have... Uh, you know, other neurological features, so he like denies numbness, tingling, weakness. And then he also, even though he looks like he's puking and pale and slightly diaphoretic, that's how these patients look, right? So could you imagine like, you know the feeling when you get off a uh, amusement park ride, like one of the spinny ones, and you're kind of like, okay, I'm not feeling too good, I'm not going to eat any of this carnival food for a little bit. Imagine feeling that for like more than 24 hours, right? You'd, you'd, you wouldn't be like the happiest camper or the best looking person either. So it, it's a little bit misleading just to basically go like they don't look that well right obviously if they look like sick sick like true alteration level of consciousness that's a different story but these patients will generally like be puking and uh, not be feeling too well and not looking too hot okay so that doesn't help you differentiate it though so what does so the big things is looking at the timeline that's really the most important thing so you can really put these things into groups based on the timeline and I've I've grayed out the ones that really are not as important for you right now because they won't show up on your test. But there's some big categories that you think about. So really the first category is the patient who has had recurrent episodes of this and typically their episodes are less than 24 hours. So let's just flush that out a little bit. So BPPV is the most common cause, right? So it'll be on your test, I'm guessing. Um, and typically these episodes will last like less than dozens of minutes, so they'll last like seconds to a few minutes. And that doesn't mean that someone feels 100% better as soon as they end, but they should be like, sh they should be able to say like the worst of it was like this long and then I slowly recovered thereafter and like not too delayed, like within minutes to hours again afterwards. And this is classically a triggered event, so that's the other big thing that actually helps you differentiate. So it's first of all timeline, and then second of all trigger. So what would be the classic triggers of BPVV? Be laying in bed, rolling over, and it would be shoulder checking in a car. So any rapid you know, sideways or horizontal movement of the head would classically trigger a BPVV episode. Okay? You're also worried potentially about vestibular migraine, which again would be an aura where you get dizziness, dysarthria, diplopia, but again it would have that classic features of it lasts for typically less than 30 minutes and is followed by a migraine headache, okay, with the features of a migraine headache. Then there's Meniere's disease, which is like this weird disease that I don't have to know too much about, but it presents again within the recurrent and episodic phase and it has some associated features that we'll talk about. And the big thing is that it can and does cause hearing loss. Oh, sorry, I just realized that the thing got cut off uh, on the bottom. Let me just fix that quick. So Meniere's disease is something that you would put in the episodic category, and I'll teach you quickly how to differentiate. Uh, did that work? How to differentiate them. Uh, but just keep in mind that it does cause hearing loss. So usually these patients can be grouped into that category, and then will need referral later once it becomes apparent that they have Meniere's disease. So this this area is, um, or this category is typically benign, right? So a migraine, you don't have to do anything about acutely. BPPV, you don't have to do anything about acutely. Meniere's disease, you don't have to do anything about acutely, okay? 
Don't forget there's other things that are possible that can happen episodically, like you've learned about TIAs. You could also have a posterior circulation TIA that takes out part of the brain stem that has that nuclear body for cranial nerve eight that tells you your vestibular information or takes out your cerebellum, which affects how you feel in terms of your uh, proprioception and makes you feel dizzy and have vertigo. So those are possible. And then also like presyncope, right? Remember this is dizziness, we're putting it all together. So that would be something you would for sure ask about in real life, but on your test, I doubt a presyncopal patient will show up. But those are other common causes, okay? Endolymphatic hydrops is something that showed up in your lecture, and I've never heard about it before, but it sounds quite similar to Meniere's where they have these episodic symptoms, and it's the third most common cause of vertigo, uh, according to your lecture. So um, I would just keep that one in mind a little bit as well. Now, the reason that we worry about vertigo is because there is things that we have to do about do things about acutely. So remember, if they've had vertigo now that has been lasting for more than 24 hours or is persistent, you're more worried about things like a posterior circulation stroke or a cerebellar stroke. So just as I described, remember your vestibular system or your coordinating system to help you feel on balance has three primary features. So the peripheral nerves have the proprioception. The cerebellum has the coordination of all that stimuli that comes in. And then you also have the vestibular system with like the semicircular canals and the other otoliths that allow you to know where you are in space. So if you take out one of those three things, you could be dizzy. Okay, so peripheral nerves not typically, but the central ones, like the vestibular system, right? So in the brainstem where the nucleus is for cranial nerve eight, and then also the cerebellum where they do that coordination, you can feel dizzy. So those are the really worrisome ones, right? And you guys know how to treat a stroke. You have to identify it early and you have to treat it, right? Because brain is time when it comes to stroke, okay? The other thing that can cause constant is vestibular neuritis, okay? And we'll talk about what that is in a little bit, but that's inflammation of cranial nerve eight, the peripheral part of it, so it's a peripheral cause and not a central cause. So it's the one thing that can cause constant and isn't dangerous. Now, the issue is the same thing with migraine. What if this is the first time they're dizzy and it's been less than 24 hours? So now we don't know, we don't have that reassurance that it's recurrent and episodic. So again, same thing holds. When someone has said, this has happened to me before with the same characteristics and I made a full recovery, that greatly increases the chances that that is going to happen again and they're going to have a full recovery. Okay, so anytime someone is in the recurrent episodic, you can take a, a deep breath, but that doesn't mean that you can't have BPPV, the most common cause, and then also then show up with a stroke that's posterior circulation in your brainstem. Okay, so any new acute new features, you have to work up as if it could be a stroke, okay? And 25% of them are, so like a pretty significant amount. Um, and that requires a thorough physical exam, which we'll go through. Now the last category is a category that you don't really need to worry about, so chronic. So it's been going on for weeks. So these are the patients that go, come in and like, they've been to urgent care three or four times, They've gotten imaging potentially one of those times. Maybe they haven't because it's always been, you know, you know, no features that are suggestive of a stroke. So these patients are either missed strokes, so either they didn't present and they're continuing to have the deficit in that system, or it's something else. So remember how there was like the list of vertigo stuff and there was like honestly 50 things. So the big ones to remember are those ones in red. So, so really these six over here in the constant and episodic. And then everything else is either a stroke has been missed. So once you miss a stroke, you can't do anything for it. So it doesn't change anything. So you don't have to like do urgent stuff. And then it also could be rare things. So remember like there is like genetic um, or degenerative processes that can happen in the cerebellum, that can happen in the brainstem. And these are neurological diseases that you guys have learned about. And typically they don't present with just dizziness and they're not a stroke. So we don't have to do anything about them urgently. So if you've ruled out a stroke, but it's been going on for a long time and they have these other features, they'll either have enough features to make you make that diagnosis of the other neurological disease, or it'll be so weird where you're like, I just need to send you to ENT. And that's okay, because the only thing that needs your acute management is a stroke. So this you would refer to a specialist, and it just depends on the specialist. So like a neurologist, an ENT, um, you know, maybe you would send them to like a physiatrist, like whatever it is that you think is the issue that's going on. And then I would also include referral for hearing loss. So the two things that cause hearing loss would be the Meniere's disease and then the endolymphatic high drops, okay? Um, so that's really the most important thing. So get a timeline for onset to categorize this patient. 
So if we took a further history and the previous episodes that happened three months ago were the exact same characteristics that happened to this patient here, that really reassures us. And even though they've been more than 24 hours, you could put them in that recurrent and episodic category, okay? And then you wanna ask about associated features. So you wanna ask about the Ds. So again, remember when you have a brainstem infarct, you usually take out more than one cranial nerve nucleus. So you'll get other associated ones. So they're called the D. So diplopia, right? So if you take out the extra ocular eye movement, so like cranial nerves three, four, and six, then you will get diplopia or abnorm abnormalities in, in controlling the eye movement. You'll get dysarthria, right? Like all the things that control the, the vocal cords and the tongue and the palate to help you make sounds can be affected. So you can get dysarthria, you can get dysphonia. And then you could also get dysphagia for swallowing again for all the muscles in the throat. And then dysmetria would be discoordination, right? So that would be more consistent with like a cerebellar stroke. So you'd have to test for those or ask about those. You worry about infectious symptoms, right? So you want to ask about those for sure because it's specific to an etiology. So you say like, have you had a cold, right? Are you warm? Are you just, like you guys know how to describe a cold. If they have like a classic cold syndrome, then that's specific to a diagnosis. And then you want to ask about other ear symptoms. So do they have tinnitus? Do they have ear fullness? Have they had hearing loss based on these symptoms? And then you want to know about triggers, right? Remember, the triggers is super important. So the biggest thing is like the head movements. So these are specific to different diagnoses. So the Ds, if you see any of them, you're worried about a stroke. If you see infectious symptoms like a cold, then you're worried about vestibular neuritis. So the most common cause of vestibular neuritis is a viral infection that causes inflammation and gives you days, so it's in that constant category because it's usually days of vertigo and dizziness, which gets exacerbated, it's kind of like up and down, uh, ebbs and flows in it, but you're dizzy for days and it's self-resolving, you don't have to do anything for it, you just have to give them supportive management. Then if you hear about other ear symptoms like tinnitus, hearing loss, ear fullness, well first of all, they should definitely see an ENT probably at some point, but you're thinking of Meniere's, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, because there's nothing specific about Meniere's other than other ear symptoms. And then you're also thinking about endolymphatic high drops, which again is the third most common cause of vertigo when people present. You don't have to do anything acutely for it, but if they have some of those other ear symptoms, they should get referred because they can have hearing loss potentially, or you should investigate them for hearing loss. Okay, so those are the diagnoses you'd be aware of. And then again, the triggered ones, the big ones would be orthostatic, right? So it happens every time I stand up, I get dizzy, right? It happens every time I sit up, but that won't be on your test. So the big one will be head movements being the trigger, and that'll be BPPV, very specific for that. Okay, so that's your history. And then your physical exam. So we'll just talk through this one as well. So mental status, like most of these things, including the stroke, won't affect your level of consciousness. So you guys remember the, the posterior circulation, right? So you have like the... Correct me if I go wrong here, because honestly I haven't looked at this so long. Your vertebral arteries to the basilar artery, and then that goes off to like your pica and ica and stuff. So when you're in the vertebral arteries and you knock stuff off, right, you knock out one of those vertebral arteries, you can lose some brain stem, because there's the perforator arteries that go into the brain stem. So you can just get some of these focal cranial nerve abnormalities, some of the Ds, right? And then if you get to the pons and you block that off, you completely knock off your brainstem and you get locked in syndrome. That's quite rare, but that would be one example where the level of consciousness would be severely affected, right? Because they're locked in. They wouldn't be able to respond to stimuli. And then further up, if you get the pica and the aca, again, typically those types of strokes, whether they're um, hemorrhagic or ischemic, won't cause a change in level of consciousness. So be worried about it, but again, it's not one of those big ones that is truly helpful all the time. The really helpful ones is in the cranial nerve exam. So you would do a thorough cranial nerve exam for someone who presents with vertigo. And if you see any of the deadly Ds, right? Dysmetria, dysphonia, dysphagia, um, dizziness is in there, of course, as well. Dysarthria, I think I may have said that. But anyways, the deadly Ds, you worry about that. And then you also specifically want to pay attention to the nystagmus. So when someone has nystagmus and they acutely present, immediately you're thinking, this could be a stroke. And there's one way to differentiate between a stroke and not a stroke, okay? So what you wanna pay attention to is while you're doing extraocular eye movements, so while you're going in different directions, you wanna pay attention to whether the snagmus changes directions or stays the same direction. It is reassuring when it stays the same direction, okay? 
but it is not reassuring, as in it's likely a stroke if it's bidirectional. So that means they look to the left and they have a left um, phase nystagmus, and then if they look to the right, they have a right phase nystagmus. Okay, that's really worrisome for a stroke. Immediately, that person needs a brain MR, and you call the stroke team. Okay, next is if they only have unidirectional nystagmus, you actually have to make sure at the end of your exam you do a HITS exam. So remember the head impulse test, where you have someone fix on your nose and you turn their head and then you move it rapidly, right? And there is a reflex that happens in the brain called the vestibular ocular reflex. It doesn't matter that you know the details of it. All you have to know is like any other reflex, it avoids the brain and the central nervous system. So it goes from cranial nerve eight into the spinal nucleus, right out to the other cranial nerves that control the eye movements, and it's a reflex. So the only time that that would be normal and you have nystagmus is because you have a central problem like a stroke. Okay, so it's a little bit backwards. So if you have bidirectional nystagmus, that's a huge red flag, call the stroke team, get an MR brain. If you have unidirectional, now you have to answer the question, do they have a normal head impulse test? If it's normal, that's actually bad, and you're calling the stroke team and you're getting an MR brain. So something that would be consistent with a peripheral cause and not worrisome for a stroke would be that they would have unidirectional nystagmus, and then you would do a head impulse test and it would be abnormal. So what would happen is you would have them focusing on you, you would turn their head, and you would do a quick impulse, and their eyes would actually just be staying with the direction of the head. So would they be going like this? So they're looking at your nose as a doctor, and then you turn it quickly, and they do this, and then they go, oh shit, I'm not looking at his nose, and they turn, and they see that, and then you see that saccade. And so the reason that happens is the momentum of you turning their head just keeps their eyes moving that way, and the reflex has not kicked in. The reflex has been cut off. And remember, the reflex only includes the peripheral nervous system. So if the peripheral nervous system is abnormal, you can assume the central nervous system is normal. So what's the most common cause of that, where you get a peripheral nervous system abnormality? Vestibular neuritis, where the peripheral nerve is inflamed due to a viral infection. So a classic one is someone who's had it for like two or three days, and you're like, oh no, did you not come in fast enough? Do you have a stroke? They have unidirectional nystagmus. They have an abnormal HITS exam. So when you do this, their eyes keep looking that way, and they have a saccade right back to your nose, right? That is consistent with vestibular neuritis, and they'll also most likely have like an upper respiratory tract infection, okay? So that'd be classic. Now you wanna do these other things as well just to be thorough, so again, look for your cellular velar deficit. So again, like finger to nose, rapid alternating movements, upper and lower extremities, do a Romberg. If any of those are abnormal, you're more worried about a cellular velar stroke. And then if their gait is severely abnormal, you're worried about a cerebellar stroke as well. Um, and then, the only other thing that you have to think about on examination is the Dix Hall Pike. So remember, this physical exam is simply looking for red flags to rule out a stroke. That's all it's doing. Except if on the history you, they say to you, this is recurrent and episodic, okay? It's triggered by head movements while I lay in bed or when I shoulder check in a car. And then you do the rest of this exam and you have no red flags, okay? It's normal, right? So you don't think it's a stroke, you don't think it's a peripheral nerve problem like vestibular neuritis, then you default to doing a Dix Hall Pike test. And you never would do a Dix Hall Pike test on someone you think has a stroke who's had one of these other red flags, because it'll be positive. And it's positive because they have a central cause for their nystagmus, so no matter what you do in terms of movement, it'll probably make their, their nystagmus happen and it'll make their dizziness worse. So, if you're reassured and you've ruled out stroke, you've ruled out a peripheral problem like vestibular neuritis, then you do the Dix Hall Pike. And if it's positive, it's specific for BPPV. So, Dix Hall Pike, again, patient sitting up, quickly bring them down, have them look 45 degrees, bring their head 20 degrees over the edge of the bed. And if you see a nystagmus that goes towards the affected side, and it takes like a few seconds potentially, so when you do it, look at their eyes for up to a minute and you just sit there for a minute. And then if ever have more than two or three beats of nystagmus, remember two or three is normal, just like clonus, then for sure you've just confirmed that they have BPPV. And the power in that is based on the name of BPPV. It's benign. 
right? So you've just said, not only have I ruled out the strokes, but I've just ruled in something that's benign, okay? So that's, the, that's what you go through, okay? So you're using the vestibular ocular reflex and you're doing a general neurological exam, and then at the end, if everything seems normal, you do a Dix Hall Pike only to rule in BPPV, okay? But it doesn't rule out anything else. So again, if you see any of these red flags that suggest a central cause like a stroke, you need a stat MR brain, you need to call a stroke team for wherever that's available, okay? Now for management of BPPV, so I've seen a lot of these patients before. So the classic story was the story that you just heard. So you hear like, I've been nauseous for like two, three days. I w I've had episodes of this before, but never this bad. And you go and talk to them, they're a little bit pukey. They have normal vitals. They have no nystagmus. They have a normal neurological exam. So full cranial nerves are normal. They don't have any cerebellar problems. They don't have any nystagmus. Their HITS is normal, but also unnecessary because they have no nystagmus. And then you do a Dix Hall Pike, and it's positive, right? And so usually what those people are is someone who's just gotten really unlucky and their BPPV has either for whatever reason continued on beyond the typical seconds to minutes, or what's going on is they're having an episode and then they're kind of feeling crummy and then they have another episode and they're feeling kind of crummy and then you have another episode, right? And that can happen. And when you think about what BPPV is, so it's not a nerve problem at any point, it's actually the structure of the semicircular canal. You get too big of crystals that sit on top of the sensor and are just constantly stimulating it and sending erroneous stimulus to your brain, telling you what your ear is doing, right? Or telling you what that semicircular canal is doing, which it normally tells you what your head movement is doing. So it basically is just sending confusing information to your brain that gets you dizzy, okay? So sometimes you can get really unlucky where a crystal gets stuck right there, okay? So how do we treat it? Again, we move the crystals. So the Epley maneuver, which again, the first form of it is the Dix Hall Pike, and then you just do other variations with head movement. That's an Epley maneuver. You teach patients how to do it. Okay, that's the only thing that's helpful. There's no medication, including beta histine. Not helpful for BPPV. Do not prescribe it. In fact, like I don't think any primary care doctor should probably prescribe it unless they're just refilling it for an ENT. And then you want to get them up and moving as quickly as feasible, right? So like these people will just do worse and worse the more they just lay there, right? So like the yellow flags sort of of like back pain and stuff like applies to these patients as well. So you wanna like reassure them it's benign, I know it's shitty, but it'll get better, keep going, okay? And then supportive care, it's mainly for their nausea and vomiting, right? So you can give them antiemetics like IV if they've been really sick for a few days and that could be helpful and that's it. That's management of PPV, super simple, okay? Okay, we have one more case to go through. So we'll quickly go through because I know you guys have had a geriatrics review and maybe geriatrics feels a bit nebulous to you. It still does to me, that's for sure. And that's because really what geriatrics is, is like really complex care that's guided by principles that are helpful in the geriatric population. So the more repetition you see in terms of cases, the more likely you're just going to be able to like identify like, oh, this is a principle. This is where I'm applying this principle, right? And so there's like a million different places you can apply it, but these are the big common ones. So we'll just go through a case. So Miss SL presents to your family medicine office for a routine periodic health exam. She was last seen two years ago when the EMR was following, uh, and the EMR, the electronic medical record, has the following profile available. So we'll just go through this. So 78-year-old female living at home with her husband, uh, no home care. She has diabetes type two with no complications, seemed to be well controlled before, bilateral knee OA, she has mild cognitive impairment, she has hypertension, and then she had a remote history of breast cancer that was treated. She takes amlodipine, metformin, Tylenol 3s every once in a while, ramipril, she takes Tylenol arthritis, she takes Zolpiclone at night to help her sleep, and she takes Donepazil, one of the cholinesterase inhibitors for her MCI. She has no known drug allergies, and then you did some investigations because you saw that she was coming in, so you, you know, uh, emailed her some investigations due. She has an A1C of 8.2 recently. Her CBC is normal. She has a GFR of 51. She has normal lights. And you checked on her cancer screening, and it's all been up to date so far. So it was done appropriately throughout her life, okay? So what are some big things that you should be thinking about? So first of all, when I see this, I think, like, why have you not seen me in two years? 
So I always tell patients once they kind of get to the elderly or geriatric profile, which is 65 or above, plus or minus complexity, um, I say like, you should see me at the very least like every six months, because just stuff happens. And we need to do like routine monitoring based on some of your core morbidities. And we want to make sure that these things are still working well. And we want to do things like deprescribing, which you can't do if you just don't see someone, right? Right, if they just like get their pharmacy to fax you like they need a prescription renewal and you do it blindly, without thinking about it and being conscientious, it, things don't work out, okay? And you have people on inappropriate medications. So you should be thinking about that, so like this person should be seen regularly, right? And they should probably be seen by more than just me, a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, right? That's a big principle. And then you should be thinking like, okay, they're a little bit complex, which is common. They have like, you know, these things that could be interrelated, right? Like maybe their hypertension was what led to their mild cognitive impairment diagnosis, like maybe they had encephalopathy. Maybe their breast cancer has a chance of coming back. You know, maybe their bilateral knee OA affects their mobility, which affects their um, diet, which worsens their diabetes, right? Like, so this is a complex patient. There's interrelated factors. And then medications, I hope you think this is probably polypharmacy, and you should probably have a few that jump out at the screen at you. So like Tylenol 3s jump out at me, or something that, that's probably inappropriately prescribed and not helpful for this patient. Zopiclone as well has mortality associated with it. And then the donepezil, an indication for donepezil is only in Alzheimer's disease in Canada so far, and mild to moderate severity. So that's something that she probably doesn't uh, fit the indication for. And then like her A1C isn't great control, but I'm not super worried about it. And her GFR is 51, which is a very normal physiological thing in the elderly, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion, right? Like chronic kidney disease due to aging is a diagnosis of exclusion. Like some people argue it doesn't even exist. So by no means am I just sitting on that and being like, oh, they're 78, no worries. And then their cancer screening is up to date, so that's important. So what domains do you need to cover, right? So you're standing outside the door, periodic health exam, you've luckily got 30 minutes because you've recognized this is gonna be a little bit more complex. So you have lots of stuff to cover. So cognition in the head, function is super important. So you would ask that through your IADLs and ADLs, right? What do you do day to day? What do you do for yourself? What do you need help with? What can you no longer do? Um, you ask about continence for sure, it's super important and a debilitating symptom. You ask about how they're getting around and whether or not they've had any problems getting around, like falls is the biggest one. Any financial concerns is important to go over, right? These people are generally retired, so they either have like a fixed retirement plan income or no income at all. And then medications you for sure have to review. You want to go through their comorbidities, make sure that they're being managed properly and that you have like the routine monitoring done that you need to do. And then you're always thinking about advanced care planning. 78, just statistically speaking, this person's approaching the end of their life. Obviously that varies a lot based on your comorbidities. So for this one, you want to think about like, what's the life expectancy that I expect for you, right? You should be asking that question once people get above 65 probably. And then all these problems are multifactorial. That's why you cover so much ground. So management should also be multifactorial, another big principle, okay? So you get in the room, Miss SL is here with her husband. She has normal vitals, like her heart rate's a little slow. Um, she's hypertensive actually, like systolically 163, which is classically seen in older patients, right? They get like the hard arteries, so you get a higher systolic and a higher pulse pressure, so usually the diastolic is like normal, and then you have a generally out of proportion elevated systolic blood pressure, and her temp is 37.2. Remember, temperature isn't that helpful, so if you're seeing this person in the emergency department and they were sick and it was 37.2, that's not reassuring. Right, that's sort of in the range where you're like, I don't know what that means, I need more information. Okay, and then you always have to get the height and weight. She says that she's doing very well and has no concerns, she simply requires her prescriptions refilled. So that's great, right? So what would we do for that patient if that ends up being accurate? This is what we would do. So routine elderly care. And I think you guys can read through this, I'll just kind of hit on like some big highlights. So height, weight, BMI can give you clues to things, right? So you're worried about these conditions in this population and you're gonna use all the data available to you to make a decision of whether or not you should be worried about that or not and how you need to proceed. So with osteoporosis, there's the osteoporosis self-assessment test, which is just weight in kilograms minus age in years. Whenever that's below 10, you order a bone mineral density scan and you do a more thorough assessment with their FRAC score to figure out whether or not they're at risk for fractures, okay? When you think about it, when someone's obese, 
okay, they're at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, and that's more worrisome, but they've put more load on their bones, so they're less likely to have bone mineral density problems and risk for fracture, but as someone gets lighter and older, that's how they get higher risk. So those two simple factors, what we use to use that test, and then decreasing height, there's no specific cutoff, but if you see something drastic, especially in the context of like increasing kyphosis or um, back pain, then you should definitely be worried about vertebral compression factors. Obesity, right? The other end of the spectrum, you want to address obesity and you want to treat them for it. Those are really helpful for reducing someone's cardiovascular risk and improving their quality of life in general, okay? And then weight loss is something that you should be aware of, right? So if they have weight loss, the definitions in your, uh, in your lectures is there, uh, but you always should pay attention to weight loss. So most commonly, weight loss in the elderly is actually just due to increased intake and it's multifactorial again, but some really common causes are cancer, right? So it should raise your attention, and depression. Very common to get weight changes, especially in the elderly when they have a depression. So immediately you'd be like, I'm gonna screen, make sure my screening's up to date for cancer, screen them for symptoms of cancer that are common, and I'm gonna uh, also screen them for depression, okay? And if that's all normal, and then they talk about like, yeah, I'm just not eating as much because my mobility's down, and my husband passed away, and he used to do some of the cooking, and I just moved, so now I don't know like all the restaurants around me, right? That's multifactorial, so you just come up with solutions to those problems but you want to think about those big worrisome things that you could do something about directly for like depression and malignancy. Blood pressure, so I'll just combine blood pressure and diabetes and lipids. So remember that this is primary prevention, right? So we're doing something with future benefit. And in the context of someone who's older who has potentially limited life expectancy, you have to consider that. And you have to consider that these patients are much more sensitive to management such as medications. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when you start someone on them, it's different goals. It's not getting them to the targets. Because first of all, they don't get the benefit, okay, of the long term, right? So you're just really hoping for like the short term benefit, which is really like how are they doing? Like, does this help them day to day feel better or do better? Does this increase their quality of life? So it's not about prolonging life with treatment of this, it's about improving life. Okay, so you would only treat it if it makes an acute difference or they have a life expectancy where you think they're gonna get the benefits of the long-term effects. So I'll just leave that at that. BMD, we kind of already went over. Everyone deserves one BMD once they're 65 or older if they haven't had one before. And then of course there's more complex risk factor stratification that I won't go into. And then cancer screening is a big one. The point is, is that these are the only cancer screenings that are justified or recommended. And lots of them are still quite weak evidence but they are suggested in guidelines. Everything else is a no-go, okay? So don't do a chest x-ray for lung cancer. Um, don't screen for breast cancer beyond 74. If someone has symptoms, of course that changes things, but from a screening context, these are the things you can hang your hat on that you're justified doing. Everything else is inappropriate in a wild goose chase. And then the last one is immunizations. The big ones are shingles and pneumococcal for older ages, and then don't forget that your tetanus runs out every 10 years, so you may have to update that. Okay, so that's what you would do for this patient. Also, let's talk about medications, because that's something automatically you should do every single time. So there's two things that you need to do for an elderly patient, and that you should think about. The first is de-prescribe. So we always, always think about like, what medication can I give that will be helpful? So remember, in your management plans that I've explained to you, under therapy, there's conservative, then there's pharmacotherapy, then there's invasive. Elderly patients are really good conservative candidates because the pharmacotherapy causes side effects and they get less benefit from it potentially, and we'll talk about why. And then the invasive stuff is stuff that they just can't handle. They don't have the physiological reserve to go through a surgery, for example. Okay, so what's the reasons that medications are such a big deal? So one part of it is the kidneys, but really the biggest factor is actually the change in uh, what makes up an older person's body. So you have increased fat and decreased water. So remember, fat is hydrophobic, so it doesn't have water in it. Muscle is hydrophilic, so it has water in it. So as elderly patients become more frail in general, they'll lose muscle mass, they'll potentially gain some fat. So you change the distribution of drugs. So when you have hydrophilic drugs, there's less water for them to go into, so you get higher concentrations of them right, more urgently, and they maybe get excreted a little bit faster. And then when you have a hydrophobic drug, it'll go into the fat and it'll stay longer. So it changes how long or how often 
you have to prescribe that medication. So it changes things. So it changes how we, we have less ability to predict how an elderly patient will respond to a medication than we do someone who's younger. And mainly that's because of these factors which aren't captured by randomized control trials that happen on younger, healthier patients with less comorbidities. So we have to be very careful. We're basically doing an experiment every single time we give an elderly patient a medication. Other factors that are important but not as important as that first one is decreasing uh, excretion and metabolism by the liver and the kidneys. Then also just the sensitivity of the effect. Remember, they have less physiological reserve, so a little bit of alcohol which may have a different effect on you, will have maybe a more profound effect on them based purely on the pharmacodynamics, okay? So we deprescribe things that are no longer indicated. Classics would be things like opioids, so only indicated for acute pain or cancer pain, which this patient has neither, okay? PPIs classically are used as a chronic prescription when they're actually acute. PPIs is just like any other medication. You use it when it's efficacious and when it has bringing benefit, and then you stop it as soon as you can. And then no longer benefiting, so the classic ones are the cardiovascular meds, as I've already explained. Side effects, um, you know, the big ones is this set of sedative hypnotics. So opioids is also a sedative. Antipsychotics is in this criteria. These are the ones that are like anticholinergics is a big one. Sleep aids, right? Like the sleep aid that this patient is on. These are all things that increase mortality and complications, okay, which these patients are more sensitive to. And then whenever you deprescribe something, always consider a taper. So especially the things like the sedative hypnotics will need a long taper that's months long in order for them to come off it because not only are they more sensitive to the drug effect, they're more sensitive to the withdrawal effect of the drug as well. Okay? And then prescribe, again, you only prescribe things based on a shared decision where the functional benefits for that patient is better than the risk or the interaction with their other comorbidities and the other medications they're on. You start low and go slow. Remember, we're doing an experiment. This is like a phase one experiment, right, where you're just trying to figure out what the right drug dose is for this person. So you start low and go slow to avoid side effects. When you're actually writing the prescription, helpful things is like blister packing and then also thinking about financial concerns. Like, you know, every month prescription, might be more convenient, but also more expensive because they have to pay a co-payment based on their insurance coverage here in Canada. And then you always monitor closely because any drug that has been prescribed should always then be considered for deprescription immediately. Okay, so if it all was, it, no matter how short it is, could be one single dose, if it fits the criteria for deprescription, you deprescribe it. Okay, so that's medication. So now we're back in the room, and this is classic. So we're at 12.30 now as well, so we're gonna go um, we're going to go 15 minutes over, and I'm sorry. But if you have to leave now, I don't mind, and I don't hold it against you. So you can sneak out if you need to. Okay, so we're back in the room. And so, again, the exact same thing, but now her husband has a few concerns, including some atypical behaviors that his wife has been demonstrating. She sometimes speaks to people that are not present. She has been sleeping more and now has been refusing to go out in their daily walks that they used to enjoy. She has fallen twice in the past year, which caused significant bruising, but no major injury, right? So this is like obviously information that you have to do something with. So let me give you a framework of what you do it with. So again, cognition is complex. Oh, sorry. So, you know, like what else would you ask about? So let me tell you. So cognition is complex, right? So it can present with someone being like, I have memory problems. It can present with someone being like, I'm not acting like myself, so like personality changes. Or it can just be really atypical behaviors like responding to hallucinations. Um, or like having complex things like language problems, right? That's all cognition or, um, or what's the word I'm trying to think of? Or cortex problems. Remember like the cortex syndromes you guys learned about? That's all within cognition. So they can present in any way. And dementia actually has a very simple di diagnostic criteria. So impairment in greater than one or just one cognitive domain. And they also have to have impairment in their function. So usually that's at least one. ADL or IADL, right? That's the dementia criteria. And then the differential diagnosis is those four big ones that you have to think about because they're the most common. And then you also have to actively rule out two things. One is delirium and the other one is depression, okay? There is other things that can have cognitive problems, right? Like if you have an MCA stroke that takes out Broca's area, you'll have an aphasia, which is a cognitive problem, but that's separate from these. So there is other things, but they don't present primarily with a cognition problem. 
Okay, so delirium, how do we rule it out? Use the CAM criteria, right, which is the two first criteria you have to have and then one of the second two. And this has really good high sensitivity and specificity, so I just recommend using that. You haven't learned much about depression, but low mood or anhedonia, one of those two is required for depression. So it gets a little bit more complex, but basically if you just screen for those things, you don't get a flavor of those things then you can rule out depression. So this patient has stopped going on their walks that used to interest. So you definitely want to clarify, like, are you doing that because you just don't want to go? Or are you doing that because you want to go and you're unable to, right? And how has your mood been? And if she denies a low mood and you get good corroborating evidence of that, and then she denies anhedonia, so she's, anhedonia is the loss of enjoyment and something you used to enjoy. So if she denies those two things, you can essentially rule out depression. So that's how I do it in real life, okay? So a little bit more on delirium. Delirium, I know you guys have learned a lot about this, so I'll just quickly tell you my like helpful tips. Delirium is acute brain failure. So just like any other end organ failure, it is something that should be taken seriously and treated, okay? It equals mortality. People die at a higher rate when they're delirious than when they're not. So it's multifactorial, just like many things, right? So the big ones that you should think of is like sensory deficit, so all sensations. Sight, hearing, touch. Anything like that can be abnormal. So sights, like do they have their glasses? Do they have the hearing aids? Touch, like do they have a painful stimulus? So the classic painful stimulus is constipation and urinary retention, okay? So those are sensations that you have to worry about, pain. The environment, right? So when someone comes into hospital or moves, they're in a new environment that's unfamiliar, that can contribute. And then the big medical ones are drugs, okay? So like any medications, anticholinergics, sedative, hypnotics, those are the big classic ones infections, any infection whatsoever. Just remember, it just depends on how vulnerable or sensitive this patient is, and any infection can tip them over to delirium. Metabolic, right? So metabolic stuff is like the metabolism of your body. So think of the metabolic or endocrine things like thyroid, blood sugars, electrolytes, kidney function, liver function. All of those things cause encephalopathy and can contribute to a delirium, which is a type of encephalopathy. And then structural. So basically structural, I just think of as neurological disease. So any acute or chronic thing. So you should always worry about like, is this an acute stroke that's now pushing you into delirium? Or maybe they chronically have something like MS, Parkinson's, that would all predispose you, dementia itself predispose you to being more likely to have delirium. Really the big thing is just diagnose it with CAM and there's two flavors of classic patients you should find. So hyperactive, so there's this funny old lady who was from like the United States from somewhere who was here in the Foothills emergency like a couple years ago with her husband and she was walking around and she was calling, uh, I don't even want to say it, she was calling everyone mother effers and she was you know, saying everyone was like being discriminatory and racist and such and her husband is like, I, like, I swear she's not normally like this, like she's a really like nice reserved person and she had hyperactive delirium, right? So that one's like in your face obvious and then the other one that's more subtle is hypoactive. So these are people that like they're in hospital and they're just not getting up. They're like sleeping all day. They're laying in bed all day. And they're having these other features on the CAM criteria. So those are the ones, whenever you see a patient who's like not getting up and not interacting with you normally, like every single day in the hospital, you should be doing a CAM on them to figure out if they're delirious or not, okay? And the therapy is mitigate and treat all of these things. So whatever it is you think that's contributing, and it's usually multifactorial, you try and reverse. You make the environment better you reduce those sensory deficits or sensory problems. You treat whatever me medical things are going on with them in terms of drugs, infections, metabolic problems, and structural problems, okay? The one thing to remember is avoid antipsychotics. They're commonly used to control behaviors because they need to be, but avoid them because they increase mortality and they increase rates of stroke, unfortunately, okay? So let's go back to the primary dementia. So we've ruled out delirium. We've ruled out depression in this patient. So Alzheimer's is the most common one, and these are the facts that I would know about it. You know, there is a genetic component, which is usually more likely to be early onset, which is less than 65. So usually this is an age of older, or disease of older age, okay? And the cardinal features is memory impairment. So that presents in a couple of ways. One is they can't remember their surroundings, so they're driving or walking somewhere and they get lost, very common. Or they'll be in familiar surroundings, but they'll forget what they did in it, so they'll be in their home and they'll be like, someone stole my wallet. They'll be like, someone's moving my key, someone's eating my cereal, right? Those are classic presentations that are primarily a memory problem, okay? Don't forget the pathology of it is a tau neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. The diagnosis is post-mortem, right? So we always say we think this person 
or we, we kind of label them as Alzheimer's, but it's not confirmed until postmortem. And the therapy is if cholinesterase inhibitors, but again, only in mild to moderate disease. Usually mild is where it's the most benefit. Then you want to think about vascular, the second most common, so 10% of dementias. And the cardinal features is cardiovascular risk factors, and it's stepwise deterioration. So all of the other dementias were sort of insidious, and they happen at different rates, like weeks to months to years. But it's just like, yeah, it slowly got worse. I started noticing this problem. This one is like, she was fine, and all of a sudden the next day she couldn't drive. And then the next day she couldn't get out of bed, and it just happened just like that. And that's because they're having small or larger strokes. They're just taking out the mental reserve of this person and the faculties that they have and just slowly deteriorating, right? You can see these chronic or acute strokes if they're larger and these chronic changes um, on MR and CT brain, okay? So that can help you make the diagnosis, but isn't always necessary. And you manage their cardiovascular risk factors, okay? Remember that commonly there's overlap. So up to 30% of dementias is a mixed etiology, the most common being Alzheimer's and vascular, both contributing, okay? And then Lewy body dementia is another one. So cardinal features of this, so it's 5%, is the hallucinations and then Parkinsonian features. So it's the same pathophysiological mechanism that causes Lewy body dementia, just in a different part of the brain, brain that, than, than, than what the same mechanism also causes Parkinson's, okay? It's just that one happens in the substantia nigra. This one happens more in the cortex and diffusely throughout the brain, okay? Um, so they can present with Parkinsonian features, or they can have Parkinson's, and then they progress to dementia, and that could potentially be Lewy body, or it could potentially just be the natural history of their Parkinson's. You guys remember like with MS, Parkinson's, any of these chronic neurological central nervous system disorders, they usually deteriorate cognitively overall and leads to like a dementia type picture, okay? And then the pathology is alpha synuclein, and then the therapy really is like avoid antipsychotics again. Do you see a theme here? And then also levodopa for the Parkinsonian features, okay? And then frontotemporal is another one. It happens a little bit younger, so in middle-aged people, 45 to 65 years old, 5%. And the cardinal features, there's two different types. There's like the mainly behavioral types and the mainly language types, but there's overlap as well. So just remember like big personality changes where they start becoming like inappropriate or just vastly different people. They're disinhibited, basically. And then they also could potentially have language impairments. And then they have this weird specific feature with hyperorality where they like eat more, they binge eat, they explore their own mouths, they put inedible objects in their mouths because they like it. And it's like very specific to this. So you hear that on the test, that's what you should think. And then again, it has a different protein. So the main thing is like there's different proteins for each of these. So that's like a differentiating feature that it could actually ask you about in pathology. Okay. The main thing is I wrote down specific therapies, but overall the therapy for these things is supporting someone's function. This is supportive care at its most ambitious form in terms of chronically and comprehensively. So you're supporting someone by saying like, how do we solve that problem that's arising because of the dementia? We're not actually treating the dementia. Okay, so that's all that dementia care is, and we just use a bunch of different resources to do that, right? So we like educate the patient and family about it, we do our advanced planning, and we pull in a bunch of resources, okay, and we avoid other con like contributing factors, like are they on an anticholinesterase uh, or anticholinergic medication, right? Because that would contribute as well. So you give them, you optimize other parts of their care, and you treat the symptoms. So that's supportive care, right? It's just like a really complex and really ambitious form of it, okay? Next is falls. So when I think about falls, okay, that this patient had, I always think about like, what are the risk factors? So I like, again, create a typical patient that would be at really high risk for falls. So the older they are, if they're hospitalized, if they're female, if they're on medications that can make them dizzy or have hypotension, if they have weakness on exam, those are all risk factors. But the biggest two is they have an abnormal gait. So in the family doctor's office, every single patient I see get up and walk out the door or walk in. And every single time, I'm always like, that person's at risk for a fall, if you see it, right? And then a fall in the last year as well. So that's why you have to ask. So the first thing is you screen for falls and you ask about it. And if they've had multiple falls or an injury, then you have to objectively do the get up and go. So that tests multiple domains. So it tests their gait, their balance, their posture. Right, or postural symptoms, like if they get up and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, and then they're walking completely fine, it's like, well, you have postural hypotension that could potentially predispose you to a fall. 
right? So you're taking in all those factors. And then really it's like, why do we care? So the morbidity. So the two most common things is the hip fracture. You guys all know how bad that is. Like around a third will die within a year. Around another third will need increased support at, at home in terms of care level. And then another third may make a full recovery, okay? So that's a big deal. And then TBI, right? Especially in this population, they have decreased reflexes to like stop themselves. So they hit their heads when they come to the ground. And they're commonly on things like ASA81 or anticoagulants, which can cause like a subdural hematoma, which can be deadly or can be chronic and cause lots of morbidity, okay? So that's why we care. And then what do we do about it? So the big things is like make sure optimizing, like we care because of the fracture risk mainly and, and the TBI, like the subdural hematoma risk. Um, so we optimize that by giving them calcium and vitamin D. We improve their functional status as best we can with exercise programs. And then we do a home care assessment to look at the environment as well, right? Like are they wearing the right footwear? Do they using the right mobility aids? Is there rugs that are dangerous there? Is there handles to help them out of the bath and up the stairs? So you do that home care assessment to cover like the environmental aspect. And then you obviously mitigate any other risk factors. Like is there a medication they're on that's making them potentially have postural hypotension? Is the fact that they have osteoporosis make them at higher risk for when they do fall that they do break something, right? So you wanna treat that if it's present. So you, you think about the risk factors, you create a patient who has all of the bad risk factors, you remember why you're doing it, and then you just try and figure out which of those risk factors is contributing the most, and you try to reverse them, okay? Generally speaking, it's always helpful to give calcium and vitamin D. It's always helpful to you know, encourage or refer them to an exercise program, and it's always helpful to do a home care assessment, okay? So back to the case. So the patient continues to deny issues with memory and function. The husband gives details of her speaking to and about strange things in the bedroom when falling asleep. She has had some memory issues with trivial things, but still remembers appointments. She stopped driving and cooking in the past few months, but is independent in all ADLs and is continent of urine and stool, right? So again, we're getting some of those classic buzzwords for Lewy body dementia, okay? Her IADLs are impacted. She stopped driving, right? So we would want to make sure that this is in a stepwise progression because then we would think that Maybe this is Lewy bodies and vascular, okay? Could be both of those as well. That's also quite common. Um, and then we know that she's caught in her urine and stool, so that helps us with the differential as well. And then again, it's not a primary memory problem, right? So memory decreases with age, but like if someone is going day to day and not complaining or distressed about like losing things, getting lost, someone in their house moving things around on them, then their memory's good enough and it's not probably an Alzheimer's disease, right? Once Alzheimer's is bad enough to affect your IADLs and ADLs, your memory is usually so severe, severely impaired that like it's obvious just talking to the person for more than 30 seconds. They'll repeat their story or they'll repeat something within one minute, right? Once it gets to that point, so it's very obvious. Physical exam, okay, so we've just put on our differential big boom Lewy body dementia. So we see an abnormal gait which is slowed and wide based. We had a resting tremor that we noticed in the hands while we were talking to them. And then when we tested their tone, there was cogwheeling, right? So Parkinsonian features. So this is Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonian features, okay? What if I told you this person was incontinent of urine? What's the diagnosis that should come to mind? NPH, I think I, Sheena got it right. Sorry to put you on the spot, Sheena. So, uh, so normal pressure hydrocephalus, right? So remember the triad, cognitive impairment, urinary incontinence, and an abnormal gait, usually wide-based and slow and shuffling, right? So whenever you see those features, you should start thinking, what else could potentially do that, right? So you're thinking Parkinson's, you're thinking NPH, and the big thing with an abnormal gait like this is again, there's three systems that help you figure out how to walk. So your cerebellum coordinates everything, your peripheral nerves give you your proprioception, and then your eyes help guide you. So if you have a visual problem, you're at risk for falls, and you have an abnormal gait, usually, right? If you have a cerebellar problem, you're at risk for falls, and you have abnormal gait, usually. And then if you have a peripheral problem, like a peripheral nerve problem, like B12 deficiency, bad diabetes with neuropathy, you usually have an abnormal gait. So abnormal gait has like those three categories and then a couple big ones that I always think about which is like rule out Parkinson's and rule out normal pressure hydrocephalus, okay? All right, so 
we have the diagnosis. So like, what are we doing for this patient? Okay, so let's go through it. So first of all, she mentioned that she you know, hasn't had any immunization since childhood. There was no BMD on, on, on the EMR, and her lipids weren't done for a while. So for routine care, we have to do those three things. Okay, what's next? So we talked about her cognition as well. So she has a clinical diagnosis now of Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonism, so we have to address that, so educate them about that put in those home care supports to try and help her functioning. Okay, we talked about mobility, right? She was falling, so she needs a fall assessment as part of her home care. She needs to be educated on things. We need to start calcium, vitamin D. We need to potentially give her an exercise program, right? Okay, we talked about medications. She was erroneously on, vit on Tylenol number three with codeine in it, which has lots of bad side effects in the elderly population, so let's stop that. We'll have to taper it, right, because of the withdrawal syndrome of opioids. Done Epizil, she's not indicated for that. This is Lewy body dementia, which colon esterase inhibitors is sometimes helpful for, but at an experimental level. It's not indicated in Canada, so you wouldn't use it. And then Zopiclone, right? Increased mortality and increased falls risk with sedative hypnotics. So we're gonna deprescribe that. Again, we'll have to taper it. And then we wanna start levodopa. We wanna treat those Parkinsonian features that'll reduce her risk of falls, right? And it'll improve her functioning. And then we want to avoid antipsychotics in dementia. Any dementia, this increases mortality by one to two percent, just absolutely, right? And then, oh, don't forget, she also has these comorbidities, like she had that GFR of 51, so the diabetes maybe has a nephropathy, so we need to do an albumin creatinine ratio. We need to manage her pain better because we're taking away a pain medication. So we don't want her to take NSAIDs though, so we want to talk about like, let's maximize Tylenol. Let's talk about like some conservative stuff, right? So, the, and, then, and then you're thinking like, okay, this person has a very significant diagnosis now, like we should think about what's gonna go on in the future. So supported living is probably in her near future. Uh, you need an advanced care directive and a capacity assessment and a will. Remember to keep those things separate. So advanced directive is like the medical, right? Or personal directive is like the medical thing. Capacity assessment is your ability to make decisions about that. And then your will is like, you know, the financial, more personal things, like power of attorney, stuff like that. So those are all different, but you have to think about them all caregiver burnout, elder abuse, you have to think about this person is now vulnerable and is now has high care demand. So that's a huge pressure on the person caring for them and she's also vulnerable to abuse. So think about that. And then other safety concerns, like is she gonna be wandering, cooking, nutrition, lots of times people with severe dementia don't eat ever, so you have to like really put in a good solid plan for nutrition. So like, could we do this all in 30 minutes or alone? No, I don't think so, so that's why multi-dimensional care is needed from a multidisciplinary team, right? So just from a single patient who we thought initially was doing pretty well, but then we got the corroborating story, which is super important with geriatric patients, that led us down this path of now having to make a really complex care plan. So this is a geriatrics referral, and a referral to social work, and a referral to home care all in the same day, okay? And you wanna support this patient's life, right? You wanna increase quality of life, and unfortunately, what that means for us in medicine right now is focusing on ADLs and IDLs, but if you said to me, like, what's most important to you, it's not the fact that I can go to the grocery store or that I can go to the toilet, that I can wipe my butt. Like, that stuff's super important, obviously, but that's minimum. Like, at bare minimum, you wanna support these people's ADLs and IDLs, but remember the other M matters most. What matters most is other things. So you have to talk to the patient, you have to say, like, what's gonna be most helpful for you? What's the one thing I can do for you today? that'll make your life easier or better, okay? And you have to address those things as well. Okay, so we covered all of our learning objectives, I think. You can call me that out on that if you want. We went over time, as usual, I'm sorry. So this is my dog, Finn, and we're also Finn. So um, thanks so much for listening, and I'll uh, see you guys soon. If you have any questions at all, please come up and uh, ask me, and I'll help clarify. Thanks so much.